Good morning, uh, and welcome to the meeting of the Subcommittee on Zoning and Franchises. I'm Council Member Francisco Moya, the Chairperson of the Subcommittee. Uh, and today uh, we are joined by Council Members uh, Grudencek uh, and Chin, uh, and also uh, Council Member Perkins is here. Uh, if you are here to testify, please fill out a speaker slip with the Sergeant at Arms indicating your full name, the application name, or LU number, and whether you are in favor or against the proposal. Uh, we will now begin this meeting with our hearings. Uh, we will now hear LU 625, an application by uh, what is it? Cielli Partners uh, LP, uh, Trotteria del Arte, for a new revocable consent for an unenclosed sidewalk cafe located at 907th Avenue in Manhattan in Council Member Powers' district. Uh, I now open the public hearing on this application, and I will now call the first panel. Peter Janison. Jan Janison? Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Council, if you can please swear in the panel. Please raise your right hand and state your name for the record. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and that you will answer all questions truthfully? Please be just be sure the red light is on. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, good morning. Hi, my name is Pete Janicek. I'm with uh, Michael Kelly, Inc. I would like to first disclose that I'm a former city council employee for over 30 years in the land use division. I'm here today representing CLE Partners LLP doing business as Trattoria del Arte to renew a small unenclosed sidewalk cafe with seven tables and 28 seats at 907th Avenue in Manhattan in Councilmember Powers District. Uh, please let me read into the record an agreement letter that we came with with Council Member Powers. And actually, dear Honorable Chairperson Salamanca, Council Members Power, and members of this uh, Council, please accept this letter as confirmation as our agreement with Council Member Powers. We agree to the following: all planters will be removed and never used again. All tables will be flush against the wall. If anything else is required, please contact my representative, Michael Kelly, at 914-632-6036. Sincerely, Sheldon Fireman, the President. We, we received a letter. Great. Right. Yeah. That, is that it? That's it. Great. Thank you so much for your uh, testimony today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just for a quick point of clarification today uh, on Lenox Terrace, it's just the hearing today. Uh, we are not voting on, on that item today. It's just the hearing. So I just want to make sure uh, those that have come here to testify know that it's just the hearing process today. Uh, thank you. Okay, are there any other members of the public who wish to testify on this item? Seeing none, uh, I, I will note for our members and for the public that we have received a written comment from the applicant operator dated February 5th. 2020 with regards to certain design and layout features, and uh, we have that for the record. I will now close the public hearing on this application. Uh, I now note for the record that uh, pursuant to council rule, uh, rules 7.9 and 11.6, uh, we will be filing LU uh, 624 for the Bluestone Lane Sidewalk Cafe revocable consent request uh, to remove it from our calendar. Uh, by letter date February 11th, 2020, the council has been notified by the Office of the Commissioner of the Department of Consumer Affairs and its recommendation for approval is withdrawn. Uh, the letter specifically states the Department of Consumer Affairs is withdrawing its recommendation uh, for approval of BL 117 Amsterdam New York LLC's petition seeking to renew a revocable consent to maintain and operate an unenclosed cafe at 417 Amsterdam Avenue, New York, New York. The department will be conducting a further review of the petition and may submit a recommendation at a later date. We will now hear LU 627 for the uh, 
271 Seabreeze Avenue proposal relating to property in Council Member Deutsch's district. Uh, the applicant seeks approval of a zoning map amendment establishing a C24 overlay district within an R6 district in the West Brighton neighborhood of Brooklyn. Uh, no. If approved, the requested action would allow for commercial use in a new mixed use development as well as enable an, uh, an applicant uh, to request a BSA special permit for physical uh, culture establishment or PCE use. I now open the public hearing on this application and I will now call up the first panel is uh, Eric Palatnik. Hello, good morning, council member. How are you? Please morning. state your name for the record and Eric, right hand. Eric Palatnik. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth and that you will answer all questions truthfully? I do. Thank you. Good morning, Councilman Moya. Good morning to the other council members. How are you? Hello, Margaret Chin, and hello, Mr. Grzenczyk, and hello, Council Member Perkins. Good morning. Uh, we had a presentation for you, an electronic presentation, uh, which I see is not up on the boards right now. We have some handouts in the back, which I can get for you if you'd like, but it's a relatively straightforward rezoning. Is it up there? Can, uh... Thank you. I'm 50, so electronic, you know, I'm not as good as my age anymore. Thank you very much for spending the time. This, thank you very much for the time this morning. My name is Eric Palatnik, and I'm representing Ryback Development, who is here today with us, with an application to request a C24 overlay for to allow for a ground floor and second story commercial use in what is now an R6 zoning district in Coney Island. And the property, I'll go through a little bit, this gives you a good visual for it. I don't know if you can see it from your angle. I see they have the TV a little angled away from you. Uh, but the property is on a block that historically has had mostly community facilities and parking for a Trump housing development. The parking lot you can see is on West 5th Street on the left of your screen. The site is in the middle of the block where it says site, and right now there's a 20-story building on the site. That picture is rather old, uh, but that gives you a good outline for it. To the right of us is a six-story multiple dwelling that's a pre-1961, probably a pre-war as they used to call them, multiple dwelling. To the left of us are a series of community facilities. It was historically a Jewish neighborhood, and those are two synagogues. The synagogue to the left of us, we've purchased 10,000 square feet of development rights from, and that is how Ryback Development has constructed the existing R6 building that's on the property right now. It's a beautiful building. It's 20 stories tall. The ground floor and the second story is what we're here for. We're here to ask you permission to put a C24 overlay at the ground floor and it will facilitate local retail. And like we've been saying, things that you can't buy on Amazon. That's what we're trying to provide here. The application was well supported at Community Board 13 where it was unanimously supported with I think one person uh, did not vote. It was well supported at the City Planning Commission and it's also been well supported at the Brooklyn Borough President's Office. Uh, I'll walk you through the proposals you could see, as you've no probably noticed, Seabreeze Avenue in front of us and then the ocean is uh, at, at the foreground and you can't see it in the picture there, but there's Asher Levy Park in front of us, which is a gem of Coney Island. Uh, the former Bur Brooklyn Borough President and the current Brooklyn Borough President uh, are, are doing concerts there during the summer in the band shells and it's really the hub of Coney Island. This building will activate that park and really uh, add some liveliness to the streets. Uh, there are other commercial uses around us. I'm going to flip through here and show you in a second. This is the site. You can see there on the, in all these pictures, you see the building in scaffolding. That's the building under construction right now. Uh, of important note while we're talking is West Brighton Avenue, which is on, I'm going to flip to a picture in a second, has the elevated rails on it. So what we're proposing to do, and here's the elevated train you can see right here in the top right picture, our building fronts right up against it. So the as of right scenario for the development is to have parking at the ground floor and the second floor, which really does not do much to enhance the streetscape, uh, especially on the elevated train side. On the Seabreeze side, the building uh, city planning, when we brought it to them for a preliminary meeting, they asked if we would set the building back 15 or 20 feet on the Seabreeze side so that we could create almost a plaza area. And the developers who are here today graciously agreed to do that. So the development you're about to see, and I'm um, proposing to you includes a couple of amenities that weren't necessarily required under zoning. And I think I lost my signal here. Oh, there we go. Oh, nope. 
You must have the same tech person who helps me. Here we go, it's back up. So here's the rezoning, you could see we're proposing a C24 overlay over the entirety of the block. And I'll click through here. This is the, what I was talking about before. This is what's filed at the Department of Buildings right now. That's what is allowed to be at the ground level. We don't want this. This is the allowable condition, it's where the parking would be. Uh, this is again, I was uh, explaining to you before how we're really livening up underneath the elevated train. This is the as of right condition. This is what should be built without a rezoning. Uh, this is what will be built. This is the plaza area that I was talking about. This is on the other side, on the Seabreeze side. But it shows you this is what we spoke about with city planning and the developers, a local developer, like I said, they're here. They do a lot of developments in this specific area of Brooklyn and they're very sensitive to needs and what people want. And they were happy to provide this plaza area uh, at city planning's request, which isn't a part of the rezoning request at all. This is what we're proposing to do. The commercial overlay that we're requesting will facilitate the creation of ground floor retail, which you're seeing right here, as well as a gym at the second floor, and then some light medical and community facility at the third floor. This gives you some more perspectives of what it'll look like. This is on the elevated train side. Uh, and this just gives you all the, the plans and whatnot. What's important to see here, so you could, you could notice here when I show you the floor plan for the commercial use that we're asking for, is even though the, the rendered images showed you commercial at the first floor and it gave the appearance the whole first floor was commercial, in reality it's like a donut. And the inside of the donut, the donut hole here is parking. So the, re, the commercial that we're providing is a very small amount of commercial, it's about 12,000 square feet, broken up into small spaces. So you can get small, local, community-oriented retail in space, uh, and we're not gonna have any destination retail there. That's what the community board, uh, the only discussion that occurred there, was are we gonna be bringing people into the community with this retail? And when they saw how small it was, they understood that we're gonna have coffee shops and things of the like. So that is the building. This shows you the building sitting on top of a four-story pedestal. It's obviously compliant with all the flood regulations uh, and everything like that. They actually just got gas connected back on. They were out of gas for a while when Con Ed was not issuing gas permits. Uh, and uh, they are about six months away from getting a TCO. These plans show you the upper floors. You can see the commercial. This is the second floor where the commercial space I was talking about. You can see this parking still. The parking ramps go up on the side. So the entire interior of the building, the parking is well hidden. Nobody on the street, if you took my wife there who has no idea what I do for a living and you brought her to this building, she would have no idea there's parking in the building. The parking is screened. It's not visible from the street and it's all inside the building. So that's what you're seeing here on the top right. You see the, the ramp areas here. And the same thing here. You see the parking is up on the third floor here. And again, it's all screened on the outside. You won't be able to tell from the outside that there's parking on the third floor. Uh, and that's the development in a, in a rendered image for you, showing you what everything looks like. And I think we have uh, more of these, and I think we had a beautiful rendering at the end somewhere. This gives you an idea of the plaza area, of the materials they're gonna be using. Again, it's a voluntary plaza. It's not part of the POPs program. And uh, I guess we didn't have the image I thought we did, but that's the presentation, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. And Great. I, 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 one more thing I'd yep. to cut you off, I know it's important to you, there is an affordable component to the development. Uh, it's not being built pursuant to an MIH program, the building is an R6 predated MIH, but because it is a 421 or a, a affordable New York uh, tax abatement, uh, there are approximately 35 affordable units out of the 114 units that are proposed for the building. Great, thanks. Just one quick question. Sure. Uh, in addition to the borough president's recommendations uh, regarding climate resiliency um, and green design, what other measures uh, have you considered or incorporated in the project design? I know you spoke a little bit about that. Uh, as far as green, yeah. green effects go, uh, there'll be a white roof. Uh, there'll be uh, on the trees. There'll be the sidewalk. I forget the, the term for it. The bell, uh, where they collect the water in the trees uh, at the basins of the trees. Uh, they'll have, uh, of course, energy efficient ratings on the windows. All the windows will be triple glazed uh, and things of the like. Insulation is a uh, high insulation. And Serge Rybeck is right here. He's the developer. If he could speak. And he's telling me I didn't know this. It's the first in South Brooklyn of a LEED Platinum building. So he's giving me more information than I know. I'm sorry, can you say that again? It's a LEED Platinum building. And it's the first in Southwestern Brooklyn. So I was not aware of that. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your Good luck today. today. Thank you. Uh, any other members of the public who wish to testify? 
Uh, seeing none, uh, I now close this public hearing on this application and it will be laid over. We will now hear LU 630 for the 8118 13th Avenue rezoning proposal relating to property in Council Member uh, Brennan's district in Brooklyn. The application seeks approval of a zoning map amendment establishing a C13 commercial overlay in an R5B district in the Diker Heights neighborhood of Brooklyn. If approved, the proposal would facilitate uh, the legalization of an existing commercial office use in an existing building in the project area. I now open the public hearing on this application and I will call up the first panel, uh, Richard Lobel. Please raise your right hand and state your name for the record. Richard Lobel. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and that you will answer all questions truthfully? I do. Thank you. Chair Moya, council members, good morning. Once again, Richard Lobel from the law firm of Sheldon Lobel PC, representing the applicant here for rezoning of 88, 81 18 13th Avenue in Brooklyn. The property, as you can see from the circled area, is located along a stretch of 13 Avenue, which is zoned R5B. What's fairly unique about the property is that the property on the western side of 13th Avenue is one of 16 block fronts on 13th Avenue, 15 of which include a, a commercial overlay in the form of a C13 overlay immediately adjacent to the property, and this is the only one that does not. Um, so the character of 13th Avenue in this area is very much uh, mixed use with commercial presence for retail uses such as uh, groceries, restaurants, salons, and such. Um, so what this would do in, in providing a C13 overlay on this block frontage would be to cause this block to be in conformance with the commercial overlay of the surrounding 16 blocks. I would also add that on the eastern portion of 13th Avenue here, there is a commercial overlay of, I believe, 12 blocks. So there's really a strong commercial presence, and this is um, why this rezoning makes a lot of sense. You can see here from the highlighted area, the rezoning would encompass three lots. The lot highlighted in red is the applicant's lot, uh, and the two other lots are two two-story, three-family buildings, which, uh, pursuant to the environmental diligence, uh, would not be uh, intended to be, re to be uh, redeveloped. The applicant's lot itself is a one-story uh, commercial office. The office was originally built uh, in 1955, pursuant to a BSA variance, which waived lot coverage. And since that time, after serving as a democratic club for years, it has now been a, a legal office for about 30 years. You can see from the land use map here, the uh, colored areas along 13th Avenue demonstrate that there is indeed uh, sporadic, if not continuous, commercial use along 13th Avenue. Uh, this is the zoning change map where you can see the ver relatively minor change offered by the rezoning. Uh, this would enable a long-standing use uh, that it benefits many of the surrounding community members to be uh, established and, and uh, CFO obtained for the legal use. And again, here are pictures of the site. You can see in the upper left portion, the one-story commercial building, again, built as a commercial or non-commercial political club and now used for several different lawyers' offices. Um, so I think the only thing I would add is that uh, as we page through the uh, zoning calculations and plans is that the local area has been supportive of the application. Uh, we were achieved a, a unanimous vote with one abstention at Brooklyn Community Board 12. Uh, we have the approval of the Brooklyn Borough President. Uh, we have the um, unanimous support of city planning and have had discussions with uh, Council Member Justin Brandon, who has indicated his support as well. Again, a very straightforward rezoning to legitimize this longstanding use, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Great. Thank you. Uh, just one quick question. Uh, how likely, if at all, is uh, this application uh, to trigger new development or changes uh, in the zoning area or uh, the conversion of existing space to commercial use? 
So it's, the answer would be highly unlikely, other than the existing commercial law office, which would now be able to remain at the site. Um, particularly the two adjacent parcels, um, those, those are long and well-established buildings at the site. And more importantly, while there is community facility use along 13th Avenue, such community facility use would be legal today. So to the extent that either of these buildings wanting to convert to uh, either a religious use, doctor's office, dentist's office, those actually exist on 13th Avenue along this, along this frontage. Um, it, so given the, the duration that uh, those homes have been there, as well as the physical layout of those homes, uh, it, it was deemed very unlikely in the environmental assessment that those would be converted. Um, and uh, the, the real benefit of this would be to the applicant to be able to legitimize this longstanding commercial use. Great. Oh, I would, I would add, Council Member Moya, that the underlying R5B zoning remains unchanged. This is not affecting the bulk of the buildings at all. This is merely for use. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for your testimony. Anybody else? Um, are there any other members of uh, the public who wish to testify? Uh, seeing none, I now close the public hearing on this application and it will be uh, laid over. Before we continue with our hearings, uh, I would uh, now note for the record, pursuant to Council Rules 7.90 and 11.60, uh, we will be filing LU 6. 36 for the C7 Baychester Avenue rezoning proposal to remove it from our calendar uh, by letter dated February 12, 2020 and signed by the Department of City Planning, Bronx Office Director. The City Council has been notified by the Department of City Planning that its uh, application is withdrawn uh, and it states that the Department of City Planning is withdrawing the application for rezoning map amendment uh, C200088 ZMX to rezone block 5141, lots 101, 102, and a portion of lot 110 and C7 to C82. Uh, thank you. Uh, we will now hear LU 628 and 629 for the Grand Avenue and Pacific Street rezoning proposal uh, relating to property in Majority Leader Cumbo's district. The applicant seeks approval for a zoning map amendment uh, changing, changing an M11 district to an R7D C24 district as well as a zoning text amendment establishing an MIH area utilizing option one and option two in the Crown Heights neighborhood of Brooklyn uh, if approved uh, the requested actions would facilitate the development of a new nine-story mixed-use building with approximately 64 dwelling units, including approximately 16 permanent affordable housing units. Uh, I, I now open the public hearing on this application. Got it. I, I now call up the first uh, panel, uh, Richard Lobel and Ellie uh, per Periente. All right. Please raise your right hands and state your names for the record. Richard Lobel. Ellie Periente. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and that you answer all questions truthfully? I do. I do. Thank you. Chair Moya, council members, again, Richard Lobel for Sheldon Lobel PC, joined by Ellie Pariente, the applicant. So the application, which is before the council subcommittee this morning, is the Grand Avenue and Pacific Street rezoning. And as you can see from the circled area, this is currently an M11 zone property. Uh, this is within the area designated the um, Community Board 8 M Crown area, uh, and has been the subject of a number of rezoning applications. Um, prior to this time, as you can see from some of the circled area on the maps, the uh, applicants have, uh, have um, achieved rezonings along Pacific Street uh, as R7A with commercial overlays and also as an M14 R7A mixed use district. The rezoning as proposed would be an R7D C24. Hello, Council Member Cumbo. And uh, the applicant is proposing that because there is a, um, a, a desire on behalf of 
uh, the applicant as well as as expressed members of the community to see many of these M1 properties rezoned. So uh, in prior city-sponsored rezonings, much of the surrounding area was rezoned from uh, from non-contextual to contextual residential districts, but many of the M1 properties remained zoned manufacturing, uh, leaving to, leading to commercial uses and vacant lots. Uh, so what we are proposing here would be an R70 with a C24, which would result in this instance in a mixed-use building. There would be, a, as stated, a nine-story building with ground floor commercial uses and residential units above, totaling roughly 64 units. The rezoning is currently proposed for the northeast and southwest corners of Grand Avenue and Pacific Streets. And as you can see from the land use map, the uh, uh, density in the area is um, similar to what is being proposed. There is R7D to the northeast of the property. There's R7A around the property. And so uh, as members of the community board can attest to, this is part of the study area that was put forth by the community board. And there were resolutions that were issued with regards to what they wanted to see in this area. So there's been quite a collaborative process, which we can talk about, um, but the end result would be the zoning map that you see before you, which would map the R7DC24 overlay on both of these corners. Uh, with the R7A along Pacific Street, the R7D was seen to be more appropriate at this intersection, given that Grand Avenue uh, generally offers greater street access and would allow for slightly higher density. So you can see from pictures here, you've got an unused vacant lot, which would be um, developed under the proposal to produce the building as is seen before you here. This is a nine-story building uh, with, um, again, ground floor commercial. Importantly, with regards to the discussions with the community board, the community board resolutions, as well as the Brooklyn Borough President's resolutions uh, and report dictate that they wanted to see M-Crown uses in the area. And so M-Crown uses are defined uses as pursuant to the community board's resolutions, which include use groups three and four, and then various uses between use groups nine and 16 and 17, which are uh, circumscribed and which appear in the community board's resolutions. So part of the uh, support of the community board was conditioned upon the ability of the applicant to enter into a binding agreement with the community board, which would be recorded against the property and which would mandate that for uh, in perpetuity that the ground floor commercial uses be devoted 25% uh, of the lot area to M-Crown uses. And so um, in what has been a phenomenally collaborative effort, um, Ethel Tyus, the um, CBA chair who's with us today, Rob Witherwax, who's a member of the community board, and Gib Vaconi, the land use chair, have all uh, contributed greatly to this process, have spent hours and hours of their time on this in meetings, in emails, and phone calls. And so through this, uh, what is just an amazingly collaborative process, we have actually this morning signed and transferred an agreement to the community board, which memorializes the applicant's willingness to maintain these M-Crown uses. Um, prior to answering any questions, and Ellie's available for questions as well, I'd say that uh, at this point, I've been at this for quite some time, and uh, the efforts that have been put forth by uh, members of the community board have been nothing short of phenomenal. They have been uh, truly giving of themselves and their time in an effort to see uh, their area improved in a way that um, they feel is going to benefit most community board members uh, to the greatest extent possible. So we're extremely thankful for everything they've done. I'm sure that they will have their own comments on the application, and we'd be happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you. And uh, I just want to uh, note that we've been joined by uh, Majority Leader uh, Cumbo. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, just a couple of questions here. Uh, how did you determine the uh, R7D uh, 5.6 FAR, um, and what was the uh, appropriate density here? So um, first and foremost, given the experience that many applicants have had in this area, we consulted with the community board and their uh, M-Crown resolutions, which dictated a, uh, a floor area ratio of roughly four to five FAR on this block frontage. Uh, having been at the community board for many meetings and hearings, both within the context of this application and, and, and just generally, uh, we were aware that this was a general guideline. The land use rationale for this uh, was such that um, a mixed use development here would make sense. There is um, currently a vacant lot. 
there was a desire for more housing, including affordable housing. And so given the R7A and the appropriateness of that on Pacific Street, the fact that you have um, Pacific Street and Grand Avenue here, that you have, you know, you're relatively close a block away from Atlantic Avenue kind of merited a, a greater density. And so 5.6 uh, FAR for the R7D was what was deemed appropriate in that application. Are there other examples of uh, North 7D uh, on narrow streets in Brooklyn? So we, we uh, I'm sorry, we, so when we look at this zoning map in particular and some of the prior city-sponsored rezonings, you've got R7Ds to the northeast. Uh, and we did submit to city planning uh, that um, we have other areas where not just R7D, but even R8A was deemed appropriate on streets and on side streets. So. Um, for example, South Portland Avenue, there was a rezoning that was uh, deemed to be appropriate at a greater density than R7D. So we did submit those examples to city planning. And I think probably given the, um, not only the, uh, the land use patterns in, on Grand Avenue, but also the relative uh, nature of transportation in the area, the, well, the fact that it's well served by transportation, uh, and the, the fact that this pro these properties being zoned M1, that they're there's a desire to incentivize developers to develop at that bulk. Uh, it was deemed by city planning and eventually, hopefully, the community board and the, and the city planning commission to be appropriate. And my last question is, uh, why does the building design uh, as presented not use the full height? Uh, well, actually, that was a subject of discussion with the community board as well. Um, the the uh, building plans as presented, which is what the applicant intends to build, demonstrate a nine-story building. That is actually a provision which is now written into the restrictive declaration, which it would be recorded against the property as an, and as an exhibit to the agreement with the community board. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I now turn it over to Majority Leader Cumbo for questions. Thank you so much, Chair Moya, and I want to first begin by thanking Community Board 8 for all of their leadership. I see our Chair, uh, Ethel Titus, and I know that many of the members of Community Board 8 are here today, um, as well as Gib Vaconi, and collectively the Board has really set a precedent for how uh, rezonings and responsible organic development is happening. So my role as the city council member in this position is really to follow the recommendations of the community board um, and to essentially allow them to lead the way in terms of what our community will look like and how to do it organically. So I thank you all so much for your leadership and what you've brought here today. You're certainly setting a precedent throughout the city of New York um, in terms of how partnerships can be stronger with our elected leadership. So today we are hearing a private rezoning application in Crown Heights at 979 Pacific Street. The development site is within the M Crown study area where for over five years, and I'm gonna say even longer, Community Board 8 has been working together with my office, the Brooklyn Borough President, and the Department of City Planning on a proposal to create a dynamic new mixed use neighborhood. Since the proposal will help set the precedent for the wider area, we must ensure that it is consistent with the M Crown Plan. I look forward to hearing from the applicant on how they believe their proposal will meet the goals of the M Crown vision and from my constituents and the public on this important development for the future of Crown Heights. And I think what's so important is that uh, rezonings usually come down from city planning and it's brought to a community where this community board took the initiative and the effort um, to plan out what they think a rezoning should look like and then brought it to city planning. And I think that the reversal in terms of how the, the proposal came about is really exciting and, and, and certainly precedent setting. I wanted to know in terms of the uh, housing options, uh, which MIH option are you proposing for this development? Um, I'm just curious what your thoughts are because the community board has also stated what they would like to see in this and I, I just want to have on the record um, what, which proposal you're looking at. Yeah, council members, so um, the intention would be to develop this at option one. Mm -hmm. So with the current iteration at 64 units, it would produce roughly 16 units of uh, mandatory inclusionary housing units. Um, this is, uh, was um, discussed in the process. We understand the community board's view on this and we're happy to acquiesce to that request. Are you proposing to partner with a local not-for-profit organization to be the administering agent for the affordable housing? 
We, yes, we'd be happy to do so. I, I know that in the past the council member has circulated lists of preferred nonprofit agents in the area, and we've, being familiar with those, we'd be happy to select one of those and after consultation to select a, a local nonprofit. We're going to do our due diligence on this, but I think that as I've seen more of these uh, housing lottery um, organizations that assist community members, I think it's also going to begin to be uh, prudent for all parties involved to see the track record of how these different housing organizations are actually attracting individuals from the existing community um, into the, de the, the proposed development site because um, what we're seeing is that uh, the marketing efforts within communities of color are not as strong as they should be, and that's also leading to issues around gentrification. So it'll be important on both parties' side, ours and yours, to make sure that the um, administering agent has a proven track record, and it's easy for that to be achieved in terms of stats, figures, where are the individuals that are being approved for the housing lottery, where are they actually coming from. Um, I also wanted to talk about the M Crown space in terms of the ground floor. What are some of the options that you all are looking at um, on the ground floor space? Do you want to go? Sure. Okay. Just introduce yourself. Hi. Good morning, good morning. Council Member. My name is Eli Pariente. Um, I figured I would answer the question myself. As discussed before, we're a little bit early in the process, but so far the feedback that we've received is that the most likely tenants will be either pre-K, uh, early. I knew you were going to say that because you have two children, right? Well, three now. Three now. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> He's been busy since we last met. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, thank God. So, yeah, so uh, from what I understand from, you know, the local brokers in the market, uh, pre-K and these type of tenants are, um, are very much in the market. Another type of uses that also I know would please the community board vis-a-vis -vis the M Crown uses is commercial, uh, like wholesale uh, kitchen or a wholesale, you know, production establishment to, you know, uh, to produce mass uh, deliveries from the location. Um, but we really couldn't sign, I mean, we really couldn't approach tenants and negotiate with tenants until the plans get approved because we don't really have, you know, we don't really know what to offer. Uh, but we've had a few meetings with these tenants. We have an idea of, you know, who they are and, you know, how long they've been in the market. And uh, as soon as we get approved, it, you know, we'll, because we really have to design the ground floor and that particular space in order to accommodate those uses. So once the ULUB gets approved, hopefully, we'll really need, we'll look to sign up a tenant sooner than later so that we can build f to fit, so to say. Because they'll most likely need not only 25% of the ground floor, but most of these uses need a significant portion, if not all of the basement. Uh, like a pre-K, for example, you know, they'll use 25% of the ground floor but then they'll most likely ask for, you know, outdoor space above and then, you know, basement. So depending on who it is, we'll, we'll have to sign, it, sign, it, sign them up early. I do like both concepts that you're looking at. Uh, the ability to expand UPK3 and UPK4 all throughout the city of New York is important. So that's really a usage that, as a mom as well, that I'm also in favor of, um, as well as the opportunity for there to be, um, as you said, uh, open kitchens where people can prepare food and to have businesses and also there there's a, a popularity with culinary uh, cooking programs that teach many individuals how to um, utilize skills that they may just use for friends and family and how to actually turn that into a profession so that would also be very exciting wanted to also ask you from looking at the this is something that I'm very you're from France, if I remember correctly, right? Yeah, I'm sorry about that. Okay. <laughs> um, one of the things that I want to see, the design of the building is, is fine. It's a, it's a nice, solid building. It, it's fine. But what I really want to see is when I do have the rare opportunity to travel, public art is a really important concept that many European countries grasp when you go there, people come to many of those countries specifically for the purpose of seeing the design and the architecture because it's so unique, because it's so different. They're reading about it in tourist books. They're seeing it. So my interest would be, would you be interested in working potentially with a public artist to bring another level of, I guess, interest or panache 
or something that is attractive about the building other than it's, because the design is fine, but as I, as I always say with everything, I want people to fly in to see my building, right? I want them to have read about it, heard about it, see about it, I gotta come see the building. And I think that throughout Brooklyn, New York, a trend that I would like to see is that people are seeing that our architecture and our style is so unique that it brings the level of the community up in a way that local residents can see beauty in their everyday lives, but that also people can come to see it as well. So, I'm, I'm not question. I mean, there's two aspects to it, right? There's the architectural aspect. Mm -hmm. This is, you know, because of the boundaries we've been given and the height and all that, you know, this is pretty close to what we think we can build. You know, we, we also are trying to be respectful of the manufacturing mm -hmm. history of the neighborhood. Um, that's why also you can see the canopy here, uh, which also will make the retail much more prominent. Uh, but I think the, the significant way to really enhance the building and get people to travel to it to see it is on the art, see, is on the, is on the art side. Mm -hmm. As I think we've discussed before, we, we've, we're definitely doing this 50 by 80 mural, which, you know, this doesn't really look like it, but is, is quite significant, mm -hmm. uh, especially because it'll be directly visible from Atlantic Avenue. So the amount of visibility that it will get on a daily basis is really tremendous. Uh, and we did consult with a few artists, as, as you know, we had gotten your recommendations for some of them. And we've also uh, had- oh, th Then I, I'll cut you off, I apologize. I didn't see that you had actually taken my suggestions yeah, that I didn't that. recall that I gave you. Yeah, so if you remember, we had, we had uh, three artists. One of them, I forgot the name, but literally in the six months or year between your recommendation and the time I met him. Oh, I him, like you. Thank you. Uh, the, between the re your recommendation and the time I met him, he like blew up and became like this super famous, you know, artist who does things for Pepsi. That's and what happens when I recommend people. Oh, is that what it is? Okay. So um, he literally... Uh, it became, I don't know, like a really superstar, which didn't really give me the, I mean, that wasn't really what we were looking to accomplish. I wasn't, you know, if I wanted to do that, I wanted, to, I would have brought like, you know, like a fancy artist. So what we did after that is we consulted with this company called the Bushwick Collective, mm -hmm. uh, who sort of gathers all local artists. We give them a mandate of like the vision we have, you know, that we want local artists. Um, and then we, not a competition, It'll be hard to do an actual competition, but we basically want to get proposals or like ideas from different artists on what they, they plan on putting up. And then we'll be happy to consult with you over the community board on what you guys think is the most appropriate and then put it up. High the five. other idea is that we could, we, what I might do is um, we have 100 feet of frontage on both sides. So it's actually, you know, when you take a 12 foot um, construction fence on both sides, it's 200 linear, you know, 200 feet of art space so we can use that in the meantime to like bring the, the street to life and then if if the if if it looks good then we we you know we can use that artist or transfer transfer some some of that art into the the building so that's the idea high five definitely i'm Thank excited you. about that um wanted to uh jump into local hiring and mwbe participation this is something that's been really important to this entire administration, that we have greater local hiring as well as MWBE participation. How have you gone about the process of um, securing, introducing yourself, and creating the opportunities for MWBEs to bid on this project? That's 32 feet here, or that's something else? Oh, yeah, I mean, we, we, we haven't gotten to that part yet. We've retained, or we, we're retained. We signed an agreement with 32BJ as mm -hmm. far as the union for the building, mm -hmm. uh, and we know from meeting with you and from the, the community board that there needs to be uh, this type of labor once we do run the building. Again, we're about two years away from, from mm -hmm. getting there, so it, it sort of wastes people's time to approach them when the site in question is the right. M1 zone. Because mm -hmm. as far as they're concerned, they're gonna look it up and say, you know, you have nothing to, to build here, so, like, you know, so it's a little bit preemptive to, to be reaching out to those people. Although 32BJ has been signed up because they're aware of the rezoning. Got it. Um, I think that is, is there an opportunity to have any sustainability or, re or resiliency measures incorporated into the building's design, such as um, blue, green, white roof treatment, um, passive house, rain garden, solar panels, or wind turbines, those sorts of things. Are, are there any? 
hundred percent. So it's a shame Nick Liberi, the architect, is not here today. But mm -hmm. I'm not as well educated to discuss it. But I do know that we have that now with new regulations that were passed just six months ago, we have to comply with many environmental measures. And because of the many incentives that go along with it, we're most likely doing a significant amount of solar panels on a roof, uh, not only for the tax credit, but also to supply part of the energy in the building. So yeah, it's very much a, a plan for the building. Um, I don't have any further questions. I, I just want to say that I'm excited that through the meetings and the discussions that we've had, that you've taken the feedback from the community board in terms of uh, how they want to see the density in the community board, even though the zoning allows for more. You've respected uh, their desires and visions for the M Crown District. Um, working with 32BJ is really important, the environmental. Um, and I look forward to working with you on the uh, local jobs and the MWBEs, because we also have suggestions in that way. And I'm super excited about the art component and look forward to um, uh, meeting and discussing it with you further. Thank you. And I, I forgot to mention, I obviously, just like as Rich said, I want to thank the community board because although I don't have that much experience with it, I can obviously see that this is extraordinary. We were literally going back and forth with 12 people on email thread until midnight last night uh, with their commitment being extraordinary to finalize this agreement. So, I mean, the level of commitment that I'm seeing from their side is really, um, is really refreshing and I'm, I'm really happy to be a part of it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Thank you. Uh, I just want to acknowledge that we've been joined by Council Member uh, Levin and Council Member Reynoso. Oh, and Council Member Rivera. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony today. I'd like to call up the next panel, uh, Ethel Tyus and Cassie Carrillo. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Ethel Tyus. I'm chair of Brooklyn Community Board 8. I'm accompanied by a fellow community board member, Robert Witherwax, who has acted as our attorney in this matter. And I have a prepared statement uh, on the conclusion of the council's hearing on this matter. I'm so happy that all of the, the many council members are present today. Um, leader Reynoso, in, in, in addition to Majority Leader Cumbo, uh, Mr. Moya, Mr. Chen, Mr. Perkins, Mr. Gorodnik, and Mr. Levin, thank you all for being here. Um, we're very happy to announce, as was reported earlier, that we have reached a uh, agreement on the execution of a community benefits agreement for the Grand Pacific rezoning. The rezoning under consideration today is within an area of Northwestern Crown Heights known as the M Crown District for which Community Board 8 has expressed a vision that includes mixed use development, encouraging the creation of good paying, accessible jobs and affordable apartments for local community members. A plan to move forward with this vision in conjunction with the Department of City Planning was affirmed by the Community Board on September 12, 2019. The board's resolution called for a floor area ratio of four to five for lots along Grand Avenue. On November 14th, 2019, Brooklyn Community Board 8 voted to withhold support for the Grand Pacific rezoning as the density sort is greater than that expressed in the board's September 12th resolution. However, the board left the door open to supporting the rezoning should the applicant be willing to make a binding commitment that at least 0.25 far of the ground floor of the building be constructed at 979-985 Pacific Street be dedicated to preferred M Crown job creating uses and that the applicant limit the development at the site to no more than nine stories. I am happy to report that Community Board 8 has negotiated an agreement with the applicant and the applicant has executed it and it provides the commitment sought in the board's November 14th resolution with respect to building height and restricted use at the ground floor. Per its November 14th resolution, the board's support for Grand Pacific rezoning also requires that lots south of Pacific Street 
be rezoned to R7A slash C24, consistent with the guidelines in its September 12th M Crown resolution. I therefore ask the City Council to amend the requested zoning accordingly. Finally, Brooklyn Community Board 8 has consistently expressed a desire to see affordable apartments created in the M Crown District that would be affordable to families earning the median income for Brooklyn Community District 8. Unfortunately, the application, as it was presented to us earlier, requested mapping to both MIH options one and two. As we heard earlier, the applicant has now um, committed to uh, mapping to MIH option one. Um, we support that completely, and we ask that the City Council map uh, Grand Pacific rezoning to M MIH option one only, which will ensure a range of affordability levels between 40 and 80 AMI, 80% 80 AMI accessible to the range of residents in our district who need affordable housing. Thank you for su your support in this matter. Any questions? No. No questions. Thank you. Next. Uh, good morning, Chair Moya, Majority Le Leader Cumbo, and members of the subcommittee. My name is Cassie Carrillo, and I'm a representative of 32BJ. Um, I'm here on behalf of uh, over 3,032BJ members who live and work in Community District 8 to show our support for this project. We believe that in order to create a more equitable New York, developers should commit to providing prevailing wage building service jobs. Historically, these jobs have allowed working families from diverse, back diverse backgrounds upward mobility and security. We estimate that this development will generate about five new property service jobs. These jobs will be good jobs that help uplift working families because of the co credible commitment that developers have made for this project to prevailing wage building service jobs. We respectfully request that you approve this project. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both for your testimony today. Uh, any other members of the public who wish to testify? Uh, seeing none, uh, we now close this uh, hearing and it will be laid over. Um, we will pause our hearing agenda uh, for a moment uh, for this meeting with, uh, to continue with our votes. Today we will vote to approve with modifications pre-considered LU 614 for the uh, 2513 2523 Avenue Zero, uh, Avenue O uh, rezoning proposal relating to property in Council Member Deutsch's district. Uh, the application seeks approval for a zoning map amendment to change an R2 zoning district to an R32 district uh, on Avenue O between Bedford Avenue and 26th Street in the Midwood section of Brooklyn, which would facilitate the legalization of an existing ground floor medical office use, as well as bring the existing uh, semi-detached residents within the zoning area into conformance with the zoning. Our modification will be to change the proposed R32 district to an R31 district. The R31 use and bulk regulations would address the same goals related to legalization and overall zoning conformance with respect to existing conditions while adhering more closely to the prevailing uh, character of, sur of surrounding blocks and addressing community concerns related to potential increase in neighborhood traffic volume. Uh, Council Member Deutsch is in support of this proposal as modified, and we will also vote to approve LUs 606 through 608 for the Go Broom development proposal relating to property in Council Member Chin's district. The application includes uh, requested approvals for a zoning special permit to allow certain bulk waivers within a large scale residential development, a zoning map amendment to change an R8 district to an R91C25 district, and a zoning text amendment to allow uh, quality housing development within a large scale residential development and to establish an MIH area uh, utilizing option one. The, request, the requested actions would facilitate the development of two new uh, mixed-use buildings in the Lower East Side neighborhood of Manhattan, including approximately uh, 488 <laughs> dwelling units, of which approximately 43% will be income-related, community facility space, and office and ground floor retail. Uh, Council Member Chin is in support of this proposal. We will also vote to approve LU 609 for the 503 Broadway zoning special permit relating 
uh, to property in Council Member Chin's district. The application for a special permit to allow large retail use in an M15B zoning district would facilitate the legalization of a multi-story retail establishment within the existing building in the Soho neighborhood of Manhattan. Council Member Chin is in support of this proposal. We will also vote to approve LU610 for the Bridge Park South mapping proposal relating to property in Council Member Gibson's district. The application seeks approval of an amendment to the city map to demap portions of Exterior Street and West 171st Street, and together with three adjacent uh, vacant city-owned lots to map such areas as Parkland. Uh, these actions would facilitate the expansion of Bridge Park and Harlem River Greenway in the High Bridge neighborhood of the Bronx. Councilmember Gibson is in support of this proposal. We are also voting to approve LU 625, the Trotería del Arte application for a revocable consent to maintain, operate, and use an unenclosed sidewalk cafe at 907th Avenue in Councilmember Powers' district in Manhattan, which uh, we heard this morning. Councilmember Powers is in support of this application. Yes, and I just want to quickly turn it over to Council Member Chin uh, for some remarks before we uh, take our vote. Thank you, Chair Moya, and thank you for allowing me to speak on two projects in my district. Um, you know, the scarcity of affordable housing in New York City is nothing short of a crisis. Every day we are challenged to come up with ideas and ways to solve this issue. For thousands of New Yorkers who are housing insecure, especially our senior, it is our duty to rise up to the challenge and fight for relief. This project, Go Broom, we are voting on today, will bring affordable senior housing and community programming and case services and a dedicated space to preserve the legacy and services of the Beth Hamadash uh, Hagado uh, on the same ground is synagogue suffer a devastating fire almost three years ago. We have heard from residents when they weigh in throughout this process with concern about affordability and traffic mitigation, and as a result of rounds of community meetings and recommendation, I wanna highlight some of the commitments that we were able to secure. 488 residential units at an average of 53 percent of the area median income, 43 percent of which will be permanent affordable housing. That's 208 units. At the end of this process, we secured deeper affordability and low AMI from 57 percent to 53 percent. We also pushed for more affordable unit, adding additional 27 senior housing unit. The two buildings will have 115 affordable independent residence for seniors at a household income at levels of 30 to 80 percent of area medium income. 93 percent of the mandatory inclusionary housing unit with income level at 40, 50, and 100 percent of the area median income. There will be a space for the Chinese American Planning Council to establish a home base in the community to more effectively expand their services for seniors, immigrants, people with special needs, and youth. They've been doing this for over 50 years. One component that means a lot to me and the Low East Side community is the return of the historic Beth Hamadrash Hagado Jewish Cultural Heritage Center to the site. The site will have programming events that will include classes and lectures for the public and a synagogue service for weekly basis and special holidays. You know, working with HPD, we will provide 30% set aside for formerly homeless seniors and family. HPD will also develop a, an outreach plan to give former site tenant in the Seward Park Urban Renewal Area a chance to apply. We are also actively engaging multi-agency to look at solutions around traffic congestion in the neighborhood, both in the immediate and in the long term. We're gonna look at parking regulation, construction mitigation, and the impact of policies like congestion pricing. We have also secured a commitment from the Gotham organization to contribute to an independent area-wide traffic study led by the community board to study 
the traffic impact, and create a comprehensive vision for planning. The process leading up to today was not easy, but I'm proud of the commitment we fought for, and today's vote is an important step forward in creating desperately needed affordable housing while preserving the legacy of institutions like the BHH Synagogue and Chinese American Planning Council. I wanted to thank the development team for working with us and all who shared their inputs and support. I also wanted to thank our land use staff, especially Raju Mann and Chelsea Kelly, and also my uh, chief of staff, Gigi Lee, and the land use director, Anthony Drummond, uh, working on this uh, Go Broom project. The other project, 501 Broadway. Today's vote on the Zara 503 Broadway special permit application located in Lower Manhattan, Soho area, has been a culmination of extensive community engagement with both residents and the local community. Soho has been a vibrant mixed-use neighborhood that has defined and continued to redefine the coexistence of arts and culture, commercial use, and residential needs. This application has highlighted challenges between commercial use and residential quality of life. Over the years, resident has, been, has seen a proliferation of big box retail. Many of these operators have been bad neighbors and unresponsive to the community's concern. There's also no question there needs to be a comprehensive plan to balance both economic and residential need. This is one case where we have been able to get strong commitments from the applicant to address this need, and I have been very clear in my concern about noise, traffic, and transparency, and I want to highlight some of the commitment uh, that Sarah has committed to. They have committed to reduce its off-hour deliveries from 12 per week to 10 per week. They will restrict the hours of all pickups and delivery on Mercer Street between 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. and have off-hour deliveries in a store entrance on Broadway between 10 p.m. and 7 a.m. They will mitigate noise by eliminating the use of mechanical lifts, having all boxes hand carry from the trucks into the stores and having truck engines turn off while they are parked. They will continue to address community concern through a dedicated community liaison who will respond to phone calls, text messages, and emails and have corporate headquarters provide assistance where needed. They are also a strong union shop. So I wanted to thank Chair Moyer for the hearing that you had before. It was a long hearing. Uh, I want to thank all the members of the subcommittee on zoning and franchise who will vote on this item today. I thank all my constituents who have engaged throughout this process, and of course, our land use staff, Raju Mann, Chelsea, and my staff um, for really working thoughtfully throughout this whole process. And I urge my colleagues on this commitment, on this committee, uh, to vote in support on both of this project. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, I now call uh, for a vote to file LU, two, uh, LU 624 and uh, LU 636 to approve LUs uh, 606, 607, 608, 609, 610, and 625, and to approve with the modifications I've described, uh, pre-considered LU uh, 614. Council, please uh, call the roll. Chair Moya. Uh, aye. Councilmember Levin. Aye. Councilmember Reynoso. Uh, permission to explain my vote? Can I just ask, uh, we're voting on land use items number 618 through 622? I guess I'm asking committee council. Are we? S sorry, which numbers? Say? Land use number 618 through 622, the Tin Pan Alley. Not today. Okay. okay. Then I vote aye on all. Thank you. Yeah. Councilmember Gordanchik. With congratulations to Councilmember Chin, aye on all. Councilmember Levin, uh, Councilmember Rivera. 
Vote aye. A vote of five in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and no abstentions. The items are approved and referred to the full land use committee. We will now hear uh, LU 631 for the Queens Boulevard uh, MIH text amendment proposal relating to property in Council Member Holden's district and Van Bramer's district in Queens. The application is for a zoning text amendment to establish two mandatory inclusionary housing areas, both utilizing option one and option two along Queens Boulevard, generally between 64th Street and 73rd Street in the Maspeth Woodside neighborhood of Queens. If approved, the application would facilitate the development of two mixed-use buildings one within each proposed MIH area with a total of approximately uh, 218 dwelling units, including between 56 and 57 aff affordable units. Uh, I now open the public hearing on this application. What is that, Joss? Jack Jacqueline Scarinci and Najima Najina. Rivera? Did I get it right? Okay, thank you. <laughs> Please raise your right hands and state your name for the record. Jacqueline Scarinci. Najima Rivera. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? And then you yeah, answer yes. all questions truthfully? Yes. yes. <laughs> thank you. Good morning, Chair Moya and, and Council Members. Jacqueline Scrunchy of Ackerman LLP for the applicant 6411 QB owner. And I'm joined today by Najima Rivera of Hanek, the project's affordable housing administering agent. To provide you some context, uh, the, this proposal will have two project areas that span two neighborhoods within Queens Community District 2. Project area one is in the Woodside neighborhood and spans the two block fronts between 64th Street and 65th Place. And project area two is located in, uh, Mass, in Masspeth and spans the two block fronts between 70th Street and 73rd Street. So, so the applicant here is not requesting a rezoning the existing zoning is an R7X C23 with voluntary inclusionary housing that was passed in 2006. Uh, this application seeks to um, take advantage of the mandatory inclusionary housing text that would allow a 6.0 FAR when providing on-site affordable housing. Currently today, um, no affordable housing would be required. It's you would be able to build a 3.75 FAR. With the text amendment, The any new residential development would be required to provide on-site affordable housing and utilize the 6.0 FAR. So just to provide the, the first project area, currently in, in this area that there are a mix of Hotels, our site used to be a hotel and it's currently vacant property, um, but there's also a, a hotel located on 65th Street. A lot of the new residential development that's being built in this area in, in Queens Boulevard is actually just as of right um, market rate housing and not providing affordable, just building up to the 3.75 FAR. And then just to show the other project area between 70th and 72nd Street, our development site two is this triangular lot between 72nd and 73rd Street. It's currently a livery cab uh, licensing lot and also um, it's a used cars sales lot. So the, the proposed development at 6411 Queens Boulevard will be a new 13-story mixed-use building with 140 residential units, approximately 42 permanently affordable units, and there'll be 1,600 square feet of ground floor retail, 75 parking spaces. And then the second proposed development at 7212 Queens Boulevard will be a 12-story mixed-use building with 78 residential units, 23 permanently affordable units, and 5,481 square feet of ground floor retail. 
that's the site plan. Um, at the request of Queens Community Board 2, the, the, the section of our lot where you see is the very narrow portion, they had asked us to make that open space rather than at grade parking, and the developer has um, given in to the, uh, um, the, they are accommodating their request. And then just to turn it over now to Najima, who will be working with the team's affordable housing. Good morning. Um, my name is Najima Rivera, and I'm the Director of Property Management for Hannock Inc. Um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with Hannock, Hannock is a multifaceted social service nonprofit organization um, founded in 1972 in Astoria, New York, and was developed to serve the needs of a vulnerable population, population um, throughout the city. For the past 20 years, Hannock has played an everlasting role as an affordable housing developer throughout the city of New York. Hannock now owns and operates four fully serviced senior residences and one multifamily residence, all totaling um, well over 600 units within Astoria, Corona, and Flushing, Queens. Hannock is fully committed with the development of affordable housing, especially for seniors, and we support any effort towards that goal. Speedy Management, Hannock's property management company, will be working on this project as the administrating agent and um, managing, managing company for the MIH units. Um, Speedy Management will be doing all the marketing by research, um, reaching out to the community boards, advertising the project in local newspapers, and processing all the application, as well as providing other types of community-based services. Hannock's trained HPD housing ambassadors would assist with applications, uh, with applicants, with the application process, um, any forms and referrals for counseling. As the managing um, agent, um, we will ensure compliance and regulatory agreement is followed. Um, our overall objective is to provide effective management and assist with providing housing for all. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Just a couple of questions. Uh, just going back to the MIH, uh, how did you decide the, the two MIH options uh, proposed in this application? So we're proposing option one and option two. Um, this, I, I pointed out in the beginning, there's two project areas, so we, they're both in community, community district two, but they definitely span two different um, areas, Mass Path and Woodside, um, so providing both options, but proposing option two. Okay. Uh, could you speak to the reasons you chose the boundaries of the proposed uh, MIH areas? Uh, for example, like why not a smaller or larger uh, geography? Sure. Um, so for project area one, yeah. these development sites, um, they're both vacant hotels, so in working with the Department of City Planning, we believe this was an appropriate um, project area because it would encompass sites that were, um, they're both, uh, they're along Queens Boulevard, it's a wide street, um, and these were areas that were uh, look, looking to redevelop. And then on the 7212, um, this site actually, in developing the MIH rationale for this, is just directly adjacent to 6902 Queens Boulevard, which was just recently approved by the city council. Um, so our development site is between 72nd and 73rd, and this, the block between us would also be mapped, so this entire uh, track between 73rd and 69th Street would now be MIH. Thank you, just lastly, I just wanna just confirm that you did say during your testimony that you um, were uh, abiding by the recommendations from the community board uh, for the conditions of approval, correct? Yes. Yeah, they, they, one of the conditions was um, to provide... The streetscaping and parking? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you very much for your testimony today. Thank you. Thank you.
I'd now like to call up the next panel, um, Reverend uh, Gilbert uh, Pickett and Mark Espinoza. Good morning. Good morning, Reverend. Good to see you. Good to see you to yeah, my council absolutely. member. Thank you. Mr. Moya, those who are part of the council, those who are assembled, uh, I am here Just in before you begin, Reverend, I just want to let you, we, we put the two-minute clock on for everyone uh, when it comes to testifying. But two minutes you can, for, yep, but you for, can, for a preacher? Two minutes? Not, okay. <laughs> exactly. All right. A preacher, a politician, I'll you know, you name it. <laughs> um, but go ahead, I'm Reverend. here in you, support you of uh, 6411 Queens Boulevard along with uh, Pastor Patrick Young of the First Baptist Church, uh, Pastor Corwin um, Mason of the Community uh, Church of Astoria, and then I'll have a letter of support from the Woodside Tennis Association. Uh, Ann Cotton could not be here today because of sickness, and of course I'm here with Bishop uh, Mitchell G. Taylor, uh, the pastor of Center of Hope, also the CEO of, of Urban Upbound, and we are here in support of this project at 6411 Queens Boulevard uh, due to the fact that, of course, this will bring much needed housing, especially uh, one third of it uh, has been set aside for affordable housing, which is hard to find, of course, in Queens. And so we thank God for uh, the fact that it also will bring about uh, job opportunities as well. And so I'm representing not only uh, those who are part of the Mount Hope Church, but those who are part of uh, the Eastern Baptist Association where I serve as moderator. We have 110 churches and we are very interested uh, in this project moving forward. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Moya and members of the subcommittee. My name is Mark Anthony Espinoza. I'm a cleaner and I have been a, 30, a member of 32BJ SEIU for 12 years. I'm here today on behalf of my union and the 3,000 members who live and work in Community District 2. New York's economy is, a, is hard on working families, and we believe that in order to create a more balanced New York, new developments should come with commitments to create prevailing wage building service jobs. We are pleased to tell you that the developer for this project has made a credible commitment to provide prevailing prevailing wage jobs to the future property service workers at this site. 32BJ sees this as an example of responsible development. Private development that includes MIH is important for creating a more equitable New York. We believe that this development team has a vision to invest in this community, and we are happy to support this plan. We respectfully request that you approve this project. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both for your testimony today. Are there uh, any other members of the public who wish to testify? Uh, seeing none, I now close the public hearing on this application and it will be uh, laid over. We're just gonna take a brief pause uh, for uh, one minute and we'll be right back.
Thank you. We're, we're going to continue. Uh, we will now move uh, on our hearing, on our other hearings. Uh, we will now hear LU 626 for the 4674 Gansevoort Street application relating to property in Speaker Johnson's district in Manhattan. The applicant seeks approval of a proposed amendment to uh, restrictive declaration D94, which has been previously amended uh, twice since its original uh, 1984 approval. The proposed amendment would notif modify the, uh, the uh, applicable use provisions to allow uh, use group three and four community facilities and use group 6b offices. The property which is the subject of the restrictive declaration generally includes the south side frontage of Gansevoort Street between Washington Street and Greenwich Street in the West Village neighborhood of Manhattan. Uh, I now open to public hearing on this application. Elizabeth, uh, I'll call the first applicant, uh, the first uh, panelist, uh, Elizabeth Bennett. Please state your name and raise your right hand for the record. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? And I do. Answer all questions truthfully. Thank you. Good morning, um, Chair Moya and Council members. My name is Elizabeth Bennett, and I'm an attorney at Fox Rothschild representing the applicant. Uh, as you mentioned, we're seeking a, an, a modification to a 1984 rezoning to amend a restrictive declaration to add uh, permitted uses within use groups three and four, which are community facility uses, and use group 6B, which is office use. Um, after extensive discussions with the community, um, community board two, and the speaker's office, um, the applicant has committed to operational and bulk and um, community benefit space uh, here, and we're very happy with uh, how those discussions have gone, and I'll get to more detail on that in a moment. Uh, the City Planning Commission recently approved the application, which brings us before you today. Uh, the site is located at 46 to 74 Gansevoort Street between Washington and Greenwich Streets. It's within the Gansevoort Market Historic District, which is best known for its history um, in meat packing and meat market uses, which waned in the 1970s. The site is located within an M15 zoning district, and the surrounding area is predominantly commercial in character. The site is subject to a restrictive declaration, which dates back to a 1984 rezoning, which limits the permitted uses at the site. The declaration was initially placed on the property in conjunction with a 1984 rezoning, which disclosed that the zoning could, rezoning could potentially result in adverse environmental impacts on the meat production-related uses in the area. So in order to mitigate those potential impacts, that the declaration uh, was put in place to require certain uses at this site and various other sites in the area, including 95 Horatio Street, which was before the council a few years ago. The declaration has been amended multiple times over the years, but the current uh, declaration is the second amended declaration, which allows the permitted uses, which are in use groups 11, 16, 17, and 18, use groups six and nine, except no use group 6B offices, no eating and drinking establishments with entertainment uses, and no eating and drinking establishments in the rear yards or on the roof. The modification before you today seeks to add use groups three, four, and 6B to those which are currently permitted, and the restrictions on eating and drinking in rear yards and eating and drinking with entertainment uses would remain in place. As I mentioned, this is in an M15 zoning district, and a variety of uses are permitted on an as-of-right basis, including uses in groups three to 14, 16, and 17. The 1984 restrictive declaration, which was originally placed on the property in conjunction with the original rezoning, limited the site to the what they called the permitted uses at the time, which were uses in groups 11, 16, 17, and 18, and required best efforts to maintain the site for meat-related uses and use groups 17A and 17B. This declaration was amended in 1998 to expand the permitted uses to include 
use group six at 46 to 50 Ganza Vort Street. It was later amended in 2003 to add additional uses in use group six and nine to all sites at the property. And the council later modified that city planning's approval on that matter to uh, prohibit use group 6B offices, eating and drinking establishments in rear yards, and eating and drinking establishments with entertainment. So um, at the time, I'll note that um, the council, I believe, made that modification in response to community concerns. Um, we've spent a great deal of time uh, working with the community to allay those concerns and to make sure everyone is comfortable uh, with the proposal that is before you today. So we are back here to seek use groups three and four and six B to be added to the permitted uses. As I mentioned, we've had extensive discussions with the community and um, in the context of those discussions, the applicant has agreed to many restrictions that benefit the quality of life for the surrounding neighbors and the community including restrictions on the number of liquor licenses, the building height, the use of floor area, and the use of the outdoor areas at the site, um, which includes restrictions on the hours of operation for the outdoor areas and um, prohibits music and amplified sound in those outdoor areas. And that was in direct response to discussions with the community. Additionally, the applicant has agreed to provide on-site community benefit space in the amount of 1,775 rentable square feet on the lower level of 68 Gansevoort to be rented to a nonprofit arts organization for a dollar a year, and off-site community benefit space in the amount of 4,000 rentable square feet of community benefit space um, at a site that's at Weehawken and Christopher Street, and this would be allocated between an arts nonprofit user and a service nonprofits user. The rent would be below market rent at $25 per rentable square foot. And um, the community benefit space for the service organization um, could be exchanged for funding at the election of the service organization or owner. And no more than 50% of all of these spaces would be below grade. From a land use perspective, this application uh, makes a lot of sense. The proposed uses actually fit better within the context of the surrounding area than some of the uses that are currently permitted today. And the uses that we're seeking are otherwise permitted by the underlying M15 zoning district, and office use is, is predominant in the area. So we feel that um, this proposal is in good context within the surrounding area and the applicant um, is very happy to have reached agreements with the community board and is thankful for the community board's collaboration on this. And I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Great, thank you. Uh, just one question. Uh, do you have agreements in place uh, or plans in mind or have uh, had any discussions in terms of prospective tenants for the office space? Uh, should this amendment be approved? We do not have any leases in place. Um, we have had discussions with potential tenants, but there are no leases in place for the potential office spaces. Um, as you may or may not know, there are currently tenants, ground floor tenants, right. um, Pastis and Hermes on the ground floor of two of the buildings, which are currently permitted. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony today. Thank you. Thank you. We're gonna move on to the uh, next panel. Uh, Federica Siegel. Zach Weinstein. And Donna Rafferty. Good morning, my name's Frederica Siegel. I'm the co-chair of CB2 Land Use Committee. Human babies have been conceived and born in less time than it took to hammer out the details of CB2's approval of this application. 
Nonetheless, it's an example of the public process at its best. After years of controversy and litigation over this development, the neighbors started out in almost complete opposition to the developer's request for a change of use. What ensued was months of negotiation, a stalemate, and then a friendly intervention by the community board. Ultimately, a compromise was worked out and unanimity prevailed. The terms of the agreement include carefully crafted quality of life protections for the neighbors and a significant public benefit for the community at large. What you have before you is a win-win. Thanks to Eric Botcher and Pat Comerford in the Speaker's Office for their diplomacy. To Chelsea Kelly of the City Council's Land Use Committee for her guidance over many months. And to the neighbors and the developers for their willingness to evolve. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to testify. My name is Zach Weinstein. I'm co-chair of Save Gansvort, a community organization which mobilized to oppose uh, this development project. The purpose of the 2003 amendment to the restrictive declaration which you're considering today, uh, the prohibition on office use, was something that we negotiated with Chris Quinn when she was our city council person back in 2003. And the purpose of that restriction was to remove the economic incentive for development on this block. This block at that time and up until recently was an iconic block of intact one and two story market buildings. It was essentially the poster child for the, Greenwich, for the uh, Gansvort Market Historic District. Um, unfortunately, that plan failed. Uh, the economics changed, the prohibition on office use was insufficient to prohibit development on that block. There has been a massive development on the west side of that block. It was extremely contentious. We are unhappy that we lost it to uh, Landmarks Commission, but that's water under the bridge. And moving forward, as Frederica just mentioned, there was a long process to negotiate community benefits uh, that could be exchanged for allowing office use on this block. Uh, we believe that the package that was put together is fair and reasonable. We thank uh, Court, uh, Speaker Johnson's office and community board for all of their work in negotiating that package. We just have two concerns that I'd like to briefly mention. First of all, the side agreements must be memorialized in a legally binding and enforceable agreement of some sort simultaneous with the passing of the amendment to allow office use. Second of all, there is some ambiguity in the community board uh, resolution, which we would like to very briefly uh, mention. Um, in that resolution, whereas, whereas clause number 11 states that space will be made available to a nonprofit service organization at 711 Weehawken Street at a rent of $25 per square foot with a in, with an increase every 10 years, every five years. May I have an extra, thank you. In, in lieu, the, the resolution goes on to say, in lieu of space, the service organization and or Aurora may opt for an annuity or lump sum in an amount of appro approximately commensurate with the value of the rent, exact amount to be negotiated by Aurora and the organization. Um, we, there's some ambiguity there because it's our understanding that, that subs the, the lump sum should represent the value of the rent subsidy to the nonprofit organization, not the rent itself. The rent is presumably less than thank, 50 per thank, thank you, because we, sure. we, we have a, a long list of, of people waiting to testify. So uh, thank you for your testimony. Yeah. Can, 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 can I yield my time? I was, I'm really just here to support what he's saying so that you know there's, there are more people in the community that are here. I'm part of Save Gans Award and I'd like to see what that can happen. Sure. If I can, each, in 20 seconds has I can finish. I'm sorry? In 20 seconds okay. I can finish up. Um, anyway, we do ask that uh, the council clarify whether that lump sum should, be represent, should represent the amount of the rent subsidy being donated by Aurora to the nonprofit organization. And finally, that we will, of course, support whatever Speaker Johnson's office and community board to end up determining on this matter. But thank Great. you. Thank, thank you all for your testimony today. Thank you. Are there any other members of the public who wish to testify? Uh, seeing none, I now close the public hearing on this application and it will be laid over. I'm gonna read and then I'm gonna turn it over to you. Uh, 
Uh, we will now hear LU 632 through 635 for the Lennox Terrace proposal relating to property in Council Member Perkins' district. The application seeks approval for a zoning map amendment uh, changing an R72 district with partial C12 overlays to an R8 district with partial C15 overlays, a zoning text amendment to establish an MIH area utilizing um, options one and two, a zoning special permit for a large scale general development and another zoning special permit to allow a reduction in uh, required parking spaces to facilitate a proposed uh, new development in the Lenox Terrace uh, Superblock site in, central, in the Central Harlem neighborhood of Manhattan. If approved, the proposal would permit the development of five new approximately 28 story residential buildings with ground floor retail, a new central open space, and 525 off street parking spaces, 494 of which would be provided below grade. Uh, I now open the public hearing on this application and I would like to turn it over to Council Member Perkins for uh, his remarks. Uh, thank you very much for uh, this opportunity to share with you uh, the concerns that uh, the residents of my district uh, have with regard to this proposal. Uh, for those who don't know, my name is uh, Bill Perkins. I'm the councilman that represents the 9th Council District in the village of Harlem. The 9th District is a very diverse community. The residents represent the entire spectrum of New York City, from the, quote, Harlem born and bred to the Harlem dreamers from river to river. Excuse me? You can't hear me? No, we, they, we Oh, OK. Yeah, we just moved the, the microphone, sorry. The 9th District that I represent is a very diverse community. The residents represent the entire spectrum of New York City from, quote, Harlem born and bred, end quote, to the Harlem dreamers. From river to river, East, Central, and West Harlem, I represent and have represented this community for, for 30 years. The Lennox Terrace ULERT proposal represents a unique opportunity to, quote, test case, if you will, others have an eye on Lennox Terrace as goes Lennox Terrace, some in the neighborhood are very concerned that it, the, 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 the future of the Lennox Terrace will also represent the demise of the neighborhood. Very rarely has a project of this magnitude received such attention as exhibited here today. And today, I express my continued opposition to the Lennox Terrace ULERP application. For almost a decade, I have supported the residents of Lennox Terrace and the community's opposition to this application. I have held dozens of meetings over the course of my tenure in, in the New York State Senate and in the New York City Council. Over the years, I have met with consultants, housing, labor, and environmental advocates, my colleagues in government and the ONUC organization and their development team. And I have not changed my position that this project is not good for our community. The scale of this project tends to drastically change the landscape quality of life of the residents and the numerous issues not addressed by the old NIC organizations. Since 2013, the community and Lennox Terrace residents have not only opposed the upzoning, but have asked the ULUP application, applicant old NIC organization to downscale the height and the scope of even as the as of right development plan. How can you say to over 1,600 units of new housing, how can you say no to over 1,600 units of new housing, I was asked by a journalist. I can say no because it affects my community. The new luxury housing and businesses will displace thousands of residents, small businesses, owners, and shoppers. If allowed, this project will have a ripple effect throughout this community. The impact will be seen in many ways. Air quality, loss of open space, adverse shadow impact, lack of sun for all the buildings, 470 Lenox Avenue, 40 West 135th Street, and 45 West 132nd Street in particular. Overcrowded schools, transit systems, subway platforms, pedestrian and vehicular byways, parks, libraries, and hospitals. The neighborhood will have to undertake the burden of this project, which is ill-conceived for a community that already lacks sufficient resources. In 2013, a survey was conducted amongst the residents of Lenox Terrace the 2013 survey concluded that over 78% of the residents were opposed to the redevelopment and rezoning plan. 
Today, seven years later, the consensus has not changed. Further, the Olnick organization has shown itself to be a bad player in this community for years. Not just since this zoning change was conceived over a decade ago, residents have endured lack of services, ranging from broken elevators, leaking ceilings, mice, bed bug infestations, et al. Olnick's refusal over the years <clears throat> to make any upgrades to aging units has nurtured animosity and distrust from tenants. Current residents have seen of their rents in the development increase steadily with each year. Current residents who have lived in the terrace for over 30 years have, an average seen, have on average seen increases in their rents 300 to 500%. In addition, the five-year construction impact and all of the above mentioned and unmentioned issues raised by this project, I emphatically request that my colleagues join me, but with President Gail Brewer, Community Board Number 10, and the residents of Lenox Terrace in voicing a definitive no to this project. Building as a right is still wrong. Yours truly, Councilman Bill Perkins. Thank you. <laughs> so folks, 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 we're gonna, please, please, I know you're all excited, uh, but please, we, we just need to keep it down. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to call up the first panel. Thank you um, to Council Member Perkins for your remarks. Uh, Ethan Goodman, uh, Edward Applebaum, and Chris Grabe. I got it. Okay. Thank you. Did I, did I get it wrong? <laughs> Is, it, this is Ethan Goodman with Fox Roth Child. We're, we're land use counsel to the uh, to the Olnick organization, and I'm joined with Chris Crabbe from oh, babe, sorry. Davis Brody Bond, the project architect, and, and Ed Applebaum, our environmental consultant. Um, thank you, uh, Chair. Please thank you, Chair right. Moya. One second, they're sure. going to swear. Sure. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are, you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and that you will answer all questions truthfully? I do. Thank you. Um, thank you, Chair Moya, um, and, and I'd like to thank the local council member for, um, for giving us his, um, his words to open. Um, hopefully what we're about to present uh, can respond to some of that and provide some additional details as to how this project has evolved as we've moved through this process. Um, so um, just briefly to take you through a little bit of the history here, um, the only organization began uh, considering um, how to take this project into the in this, this property into the 21st century in the early 2000s. One of the first things Olnick did is examined what zoning would really allow to happen here um, under the current regulations um, and the regulations that exist today. Um, and, and that current project, the as of right project, the project that, that they could move forward with, um, has got about, about four, uh, four towers that exceed 200 feet in height about 500 market rate apartments with about a six to seven year construction period. Uh, but unfortunately, and, and um, contrary to the goals of the Olnick organization that built Lenox Terrace in the late 50s, uh, what the as of right would not let us do is uh, substantially improve the existing property. Um, it wouldn't let us bring a lot of the amenities we feel are vital to bring this complex into the 21st century. Uh, it wouldn't let us build on-site consistent uh, retail presence on the street front. And most importantly, it would not let us build hundreds of affordable units to address the city's crisis in affordability. So instead, we move forward with a plan uh, that will do something different and something much more beneficial. Uh, we've moved forward with a plan that will both strengthen the core of the existing Lenox Terrace by building over six acres of open space, improving existing apartments, renovating existing buildings and lobbies and corridors, providing new building amenities for all residents, all with no corresponding rent increases for existing residents. What it will also do is enliven the streets around Lenox Terrace by building five new buildings at the corners of the property and new street level retail throughout. What's most important here is that the new development and the improvements to existing must and will happen together. Uh, unfortunately, Building an as-of-right project tomorrow, according to the regulations, cannot make the substantial upgrades and improvements and affordability that we can if we can build some additional density and height. Um, upgrades of the existing buildings just can't happen without some new development. However, 
uh, we will also commit that development of the new buildings will not happen without the concurrent upgrades. And we stand ready and have for years stood ready to memorialize all of those commitments in a binding and enforceable tenant benefits agreement with the existing residents. What the project could bring is indeed one additional new tower over what we could do today. Buildings at about 280 feet, but no higher than the height of Harlem Hospital. The project originally had a low rise building along Lenox Avenue, Malcolm X Boulevard in the center. I'll talk about that more in a second. Every building is a minimum of 60 feet away from every existing building, which is the width of a city street. Over 1,600 units of new housing, and most importantly, between four and 500 units of much needed affordable housing with the potential to house over 160 families earning the minimum wage. We believe this to be the largest privately owned and funded development of affordable housing in Harlem, which we believe is vitally important to both the community and the city. With respect to the evolution of this project, we have considered concerns that have arisen in the course of this process and before, it, and we have made some substantial modifications. First of all, there have been concerns about the historic entrance to the driveway at 470 Lenox Avenue. There was a low-rise six-story building that we had originally proposed there. We have eliminated that building and opened up the entrance to 470 Lenox so that it's even wider than it exists today, a 175-foot opening that improves and sustains the original historic driveway into 470 and opens up views westward from 470 Lenox. One significant modification. And if you look at this in summary, our five buildings with a max height to 280 feet is one additional tower, and it is 80 feet higher than we would likely build as of right. But it does bring four to 500 units of new affordable housing compared to a market rate as of right development. Again, households earning as little as $30,000 a year, which is the minimum wage, would be able to live in the new units that are occurring here. What's infeasible to provide if we only go as of right is the substantial amenity package that would consider modern amenities for all existing residents at Lenox Terrace. And those includes kids' playrooms, yoga studios, community rooms, gyms, all built within new buildings and all open to everybody on Lenox Terrace. Improving the retail environment by building a uniform and consistent retail street wall built into the new buildings on Lenox Avenue, 5th Avenue, 135th Street, and 132nd Street. This would be neighborhood retail development about 150,000 square feet in total, small to mid-sized local retailers, and here's where the second major modification in response to community concerns comes in. There was a lot of concern at the outset of this project that this was a high-density commercial rezoning. We have removed the commercial rezoning, and we have reverted back to a residential zone with the same C1 commercial overlay that exists today. Large retail establishments would not be permitted, smaller local retailers on the first floor would. We believe this is going to retain and enhance the existing local community retail orientation of the project and improve the retailers that have been there for 60 years. The open space plan, most of the interior of the property is currently paved and asphalt. What we can do is transform that paved space without reducing parking to any residents. By moving the parking underground to garages one level below that are, that are handled by valet, we can develop over six acres of new green space and hundreds of new trees on the interior of the property. Large central parking lots can become large central lawns for passive recreation. Driveways and parking spaces can become pathways, pocket parks, and benches. In addition, our proposals commit to renovations to the existing property that would go inside the existing buildings with renovations to all of the six lobbies of the existing Lenox Terrace buildings, and most importantly, with upgrades to existing residential units. Now, I want to make it clear that the upgrades we're talking about are not general maintenance, they're not repairs, they're not things that we are obligated and must do and are committed to doing every day to keep up the habitability of every unit here. That's not what we're talking about. What we are talking about is tens of thousands of dollars of capital improvements to the kitchens and bathrooms of every unit that hasn't been renovated since 2000. This is at no cost, not passing on any rent increases, not changing the situation or the finances of any existing resident, but putting this in place in conjunction with this project. Renovating all the hallways with new lighting, paint, carpeting, and committing that the renovation will occur at the same time as the construction of the new development. The benefits of this project are substantial and significant. 
One of the largest d development projects as far as spending in Harlem, 700 plus million dollars in new construction spending with thousands of direct and generated construction jobs and hundreds of millions of direct and generated wages. Um, hundreds of permanent jobs and millions of new wages. I'd also like to make it clear that we have heard the concerns and the comments of the borough president and the community board and others with respect to affordability and affordability that attempts to go be beyond just MIH. So in addition to the four to 500 units, we are engaged in serious and substantial conversations with HPD to develop an affordability package that increases the affordability of the, of the units to be developed and works on a, a long-term preservation plan for the existing Lenox Terrace residents and the existing Lenox Terrace units. We work very hard and we hope to be able to share additional details with that as we further develop this plan. Um, with that, I will close and my colleagues are here to answer any questions as am I. Great, thank you. Just a couple of questions before I turn it over to Council Member Perkins. Uh, you touched upon this a little bit, but the proposed plan uh, is creating significant adverse impacts on open space. Uh, how are you planning to mitigate those impacts? And uh, what about the public accessibility of the on-site open space is there now? Right, um, so I'll, I'll respond uh, to those two points. Um, so, the, so the adverse impact with respect to open space, um, it was deemed that because we were bringing in additional residential population, they would use additional residential open space. Um, we did not get take or get any credit in that review for the six acres of on-site open space. It was not all dedicated, publicly accessible open space. So that was not considered in that analysis that determined there to be an impact. Nonetheless, we did have an impact. What we've done is we've developed the plan to mitigate that by investing hun hundreds, investing millions of dollars um, in upgrades to the Howard Bennett playground across the street, new play equipment, new comfort stations, and also to invest in the Hansborough Recreation Center, which is a city-owned recreation facility on the Lenox Terrace block, uh, by contributing to funding uh, new recreational and play equipment inside Hansborough. Um, so this package was the result of a lot of hard work and discussions with the Parks Department and the Department of City Planning, um, and, and so we've come up with a, with a plan that we think is substantially improving the local open spaces. Um, and the second, I'm sorry, I missed this, your, your, the second part. Uh, oh, the, the public accessibility, public, yeah. right. Um, sure, so as we've moved through this process, um, there have been a lot of countervailing and differing opinions as to the level of uh, public accessibility of what is currently a interior private open space. Um, we recognize concerns on both sides. Uh, anybody who, um, good planning principles call for there to be some public accessibility, but there's also concerns about safety and security and maintaining that among existing residents. Um, we acknowledge those. Uh, what we've emerged from yeah. coming out of the City Planning Commission's uh, vote to approve is a plan that currently provides actual um, dedicated public pedestrian walkway in a throughput corridor between Lenox Avenue, Malcolm X, and Fifth Avenue. So they'll have a free corridor to, to actually basically cut through the property um, to sort of extend that street grid through the property. So there's, right now, there's sort of a compromise. There's a bit of both. There's public and there's some private. The residents have raised concern around the, uh, the big box retailers uh, taking uh, below grade space here. Uh, for example, uh, the seller space would not count towards the zoning floor area. Uh, how are you addressing these concerns and do you have a plan for how you intend to tenant the uh, retail spaces that would be coming? Sure. Um, I, I will uh, leave out of my remarks that this, the state of big box retail in general, which is, is not very strong these days, but who knows what the future might hold. Um, the plan is not for big box here. Um, and the C1 overlay district will indeed prevent that from occurring on the ground level. Um, in theory, the below grade space, which is cellar, not floor area, could go over 10,000 for some of these uses. However, if you look at the actual site plan, mm -hmm. um, you'll see that the below grade spaces are extremely, extremely limited. Um, our parking plan, and is part of the site plan that gets approved in this project, um, moves almost all of the parking to below grade. And so uh, the one area where in theory you could put a larger retail, which is along Lenox Avenue in a below grade space, essentially all of that space, not all of it, but almost all of it, would be dedicated to a below grade parking garage, right? So there really just isn't physically any space to put a large retail presence like a big box there of 10,000, 15,000 or more square feet down in the seller space. So there's a practical limit in the site plan to what we could even do below grade. 
Okay. And lastly, what kind of local hiring efforts are planned, um, especially planned for construction and permanent jobs uh, on the site? Right. Um, so we've realized from the beginning that, that uh, local hiring and also local contracting is vitally important to this project. Um, that's why um, we have been in close coordination and conversation with the Greater Harlem Chamber of Commerce for a, a, a period of time now, and there may be some representatives there that may testify today, um, towards developing a plan for local hiring and local contracting during construction um, and bringing on an advisor to advise us in that, in that matter. Um, at this point in time, what we, what we would plan to do is ratchet up to a number of months before retailers are in and hiring to have things like local job fairs and utilize the resources of the chamber and other stakeholders to make sure we maximize the people who are available to apply for those jobs. Mm. Great. Uh, thank you very much. I will now turn it over to uh, Council Member Perkins uh, for questions. Thank you again for the opportunity to share some of the concerns that, the, that have come to our attention from the community. Um, and amongst them, uh, or a few that I'll try to uh, articulate uh, now. How long will the proposed construction period be? And what kind of impacts will it create in terms of noise, air quality, vibrations, and traffic? And what are you specifically proposing to do to mitigate these impacts? Right. So we believe the construction period for the proposed project would be approximately seven years. Um, during the construction that period will be seven years? It would be approximately seven years from start to is that a Is that an optimistic pro um, estimate, or is that a realistic estimate? Uh, we think it's a realistic estimate. Okay. We're um, watching. So, so during the construction period, um, th there would be noise, as there is throughout any large construction in the city. Um, most of that noise, or the, the greatest intensity of that noise, occurs during the number of months where you are basically building a foundation for a building. Um, you're, you're, you're driving piles for that building. Um, there are, uh, and, and through the course of this process, um, there were concerns that were also expressed about uh, noise, uh, about construction impacts with respect to, um, to, to dust, to air quality, to matters like that. Um, so not only have we developed uh, and, and plan to implement a list of measures to reduce air quality impacts during any sort of demolition and construction by using the highest, highest tier and lowest emission um, uh, equipment as, as a result of this, but in addition, what's important here is that the demolition that's involved in this project is the essentially demolition of one-story buildings. So we're demolishing one-story buildings, and we're only excavating one story for this project. So you've got basically a confined period of time in which you're really focusing on the dust issues, and so we're really focused on the one story of demolition. Once you start erecting, the concerns are more about noise, and as far as that is, um, we've got a plan actually to, uh, to provide alternate means of ventilation, air conditioners, so people can keep windows closed in the surrounding area. Um, but we're not pretending that a project of seven years will have no effects and no impact. It certainly will have an impact on people around it, and it will be loud. There'll be things that, that are occurring. Um, but we have developed a series of measures, including hotlines, ombudsmen that will be available 24 hours a day in order to respond to all those concerns. Well, I'm glad you're beginning to look into that. I, I would hope that um, that effort is uh, genuine and, and, and somewhat aggressive in terms of communicating with the neighborhood that will be affected. Uh, and, and so towards that end, how are you communicating with folks in the neighborhood that are going to be impacted? Right. Um, so, knock on wood, if we, can, if we are, are fortunate enough to receive approval and can move forward with this project, um, prior to any construction, what we would plan to do is convene a series of initially introduction meetings to walk through the entire process and timing and what occurs. We would be establishing a dedicated, essentially, hotline and team to respond to any questions and concerns. And we would be willing to commit to doing this periodically as we move forward in the process. The difference here, um, as opposed to perhaps some other construction projects, where a developer is building on a piece of land they own next to uh, neighbors that are stra heretofore strangers, we're building on our own property. And the people that are clearly of not the only but great concern are our tenants, right? Tenants that are currently you know, in our buildings that we run and operate, 
And so there's a, there's a, an, a, 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 a significant incentive to make sure that the Olnick organization's property of Lennox Terrace is continued to run in a fashion that doesn't, you know, wholly displace and aggravate the, their existing residents. There's no benefit to only organization to making sure the residents have lower quality of life. So there's a, there's a real incentive and we're willing to make real steps and commitments that would be ongoing. Thank you for the, the response. I, I'm going to uh, yield my time to the folks who are here who are anxious to share with you directly from, from their own mouths in terms of what they, what they want to know about this project. So thank you for... Thank you the opportunity we've had to start this dialogue and hopefully we'll go into a bigger dialogue. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. I'd like to call up the next panel. Uh, Nellie Bailey, Anthony Harris, uh, Yancy Acosta, and Veronica Glasgow. <clears throat> Nelly? Yep. Okay. Nelly? Yes. Yeah. Just make sure just make sure that your uh, the microphone is turned on. So okay. The red light is on. Yep. It's on. Yes. Perfect. And you may begin. Okay, uh, my name is Nellie Bailey. I am the founder of the Harlem Tenants Council. We've been around for uh, <clears throat> almost three decades, and I'm here to uh, oppose this uh, plan, uh, this uh, rezoning proposal of the Old Nick. Uh, Company. Uh, I'm not going to repeat the very eloquent uh, remarks uh, of uh, City Councilman Perkins, uh, which I believe captures the sentiment of most of the people here in the building. However, I wish to address the totality of this project on the greater community of Harlem that has. Um, gone through the expansion of Columbia University in West Harlem. It's $6 billion project. We've uh, also witnessed the rezoning of 125th Street approved by the City Council, the rezoning of East 125th Street up, um, approved by this City Council. And so I am here to talk about all of those projects with its net impact on the greater community of Harlem. Increase in homelessness, uh, increase in the commercial rents. We saw right away after the rezoning of 125th Street, 71 businesses closed. They were shuttered. And we're going to see even more on Lenox Avenue. And for those people who are here, Lenox Avenue is the historic avenue of Harlem. All of the great events that have happened there. So the issue, quickly, there are two issues. The issue of affordability, which can be construed in any number of directions. What do you mean by affordability? And we know that the carrot of promising jobs to the community never materialized because we heard that lie from Columbia University. Most of these construction Nelly, we're gonna, workers... We're gonna have to wrap it up because it's two minutes. Okay, I see. A, Most of these construction of workers do not have a book, so okay. they cannot thank, get thank these so jobs. Thank you. So please, thank you. please, thank you. we demand thank you. that you vote you. against Anthony this Harris, rezoning. Please. And please, I just want to make sure that everyone, you, you got to keep it down. There's no clapping. There's no clapping, but please be conscious that we have a two-minute clock for a reason. There's a lot of people who came here to testify, and we want to make sure that everyone gets their opportunity to do so. Uh, it's been a long day, and we have uh, a long list going forward, so please uh, uh, be mindful of that. Thank you. 
Uh, greetings. I, uh, I'm a longtime resident of Harlem, and I, along with uh, most of the people here, uh, say no to this rezoning. I just listened to Onik uh, state their case, and I, the word that came to me was just basically being disingenuous. They've had this, uh, you know, as of right, they have uh, uh, ownership of this land to do as they choose. And they say they considered this since 2000. Let's look at what they've done to the, to the surrounding community since 2000. A historic diner uh, that was very important to the community called Pan Pan burned down. They put nothing up there. You look at Fifth Avenue, which is uh, the opposite side of the, 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 uh, the slide that they showed you. There's nothing. There, there, there are buildings, there are stores gated up. There's nothing there. So the question in my mind becomes, why, you know, you have as of right and you want to liven the streets, I think the word was used by someone that spoke up for the, in representation of them. Why didn't they try to liven the streets then? They only want to do this rezoning uh, and, and they talk about the things they want to do only as a money grab. That's all it really is. They're not being disingenuous and honest with the community. And as, as Ms. Bailey said, the affordability issue is, is, is certainly in question. So I'm just very curious about this. And, and, I just, and, and furthermore, you know, this is one thing that comes to mind too, is that with the current residents, there is no trust. There's no trust with the current residents. There, there's a tone deaf perception that Olnick has with the current residents. So they're only going to upgrade the apartments of the current residents only if they get what they want. That doesn't sound on the up and up. That, that's not honest dealings. If you don't get what you want, then it's just going to be business as usual. I'm done. Folks, we got we to keep it down, please. Thank you. My name is Jens Costa. I am the Community Life Director of The Gathering Harlem. The Gathering Harlem submits this testimony in support of the tenants of Lennox Terrence, urging you to oppose the pending rezoning application by Olnick's or organization. We believe any approval of the application will only exacerbate the continued harms of gentrification, which have already caused displacement of our members, neighbors, and countless others. The Gathering Harlem, which currently has over 400 members, has seen firsthand the disruptions of similar rezonings, what it has caused to our families, to our small businesses, and the support networks in Harlem. We believe that Onyx's plan to add five 28-story buildings reduce the number of truly affordable housing units and repurpose the land for commercial use will place an unmitigated burden for the residents to access basic resources. Uh, I think that it's interesting that in 2017, the median household income in Central Harlem was 49995 while the median asking rent price for apartments was 2350 meaning a person with the median household income was asked to pay in 2017 nearly half of their annual household income on rent. This is only going to exacerbate the, the problem. I'm someone who was born and raised in Harlem, and I remember uh, working as an Apple technician uh, while I was still living at home and not having enough money for us to keep our apartment in Harlem. An Apple technician who was born and raised in the neighborhood could not keep their apartment in Harlem. This is only going to exacerbate the issue that we are encountering here. Thank you. Hi. Hello, my name's Veronica Glasgow. I was born and raised in Harlem and I've lived in Lenox Terrace 43 years. We've always been able to post any information to tenants. And um, recently, there was a lot of uh, door drops by Olnick that were incorrect, that was not truthful. And there were tenants association and the tenants would repost things with the correct information. On February 3rd, this letter was door dropped to the tenants. Lennox Terrace residents, dear residents, regarding our policy that address flyers and notices in common areas of the buildings that are being posted, 
We'd like to remind everyone of the rules section within the leases governing the units. Posting of signs and flyers. Tenants may not post signs and flyers around the property without first obtaining prior written approval from owner. Tenants are required to submit their request to the general manager of the property and will be notified within 48 hours after submission. All approved signs, flyers can only be posted on bulletin boards designated by owner. Signs, flyers not meeting these requirements will be removed from the property. Recognizing that from time to time, residents would like to share information with their neighbors, we have designated bulletin boards in every building for this purpose. Anyone wishing to post anything on these boards can bring copies to the management office at least 48 hours prior to the desired time of posting. Notices that comply with the established guidelines will be posted by the property management team. I did say I lived here 43 years, and there is nothing in my original lease that says I cannot post. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Vern. Please, let's just keep the applause to a minimum. Thank you, uh, I'm gonna call up the next panel. Uh, Jessica Ortiz, Emmett Causey, uh, Tony Hillary, and Winston Majette. So we have Jessica, correct? Emmett? Yes. Tony? Do we have Tony Hillary? Do we lose Tony? No Tony? Uh, Cleston Lord, is that uh, Cleston? Did I say it correctly? Emma, we're going to start with you, and you can begin. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Emmett Corsi. I'm Vice President of Greater Harlem Housing Development. And, it's, and we at Greater Harlem Housing Development is a not-for-profit uh, development organization that has provided affordable housing in the central Harlem area. And, um, as a long-standing member of the Central Harlem business community and also as members of the Greater Harlem Chamber of Commerce. We are pleased to inform you that we believe the proposed plans for the Linux Terrace renovation and new development will bring meaningful benefit to our service area as well as to our businesses. With that in mind, we encourage you to support the Linux Terrace initiative as Harlem Knights and I've been a Harlem Knight all my life, born and raised. We not only treasure Harlem's history, but also care deeply about its future and will be directly affected. That is why we are in favor of the various positive components that the Linux Terrace Initiative can and will bring to Harlem. Greater Harlem Housing Development Corporation has owned and operated a 100 percent affordable housing portfolio consisting of 117 affordable units of rental apartments ranging from studios to three bedroom apartments. We therefore understand the pressing and growing need for more affordable housing within the central Harlem community and how the stated agreement of the creation of an additional 400 to 500 affordable units as part of this proposal, proposed development will address that need. The proposed plan for Linux Terrace also has the potential to be an economic boom for our community, creating hundreds of temporary part-time and full-time jobs during the development and operational phase, as well as creating numerous business opportunities for local entrepreneurs. 
The development phase will also provide substantial opportunities for local service providers, and contractors, we, and small we, we businesses. To, we have to wrap it up. Got the break? Yep. Okay, well, thank, thank you. Thank you for your testimony. All right. Uh, we're going to move to Jessica Ortiz. Good morning, Chair Moya and members of the subcommittee. My name is Jessica Ortiz, and I'm he I am here on behalf of my union, 32BJ, to talk about how the proposed rezoning will impact building service workers and jobs. This proposal will support the existing building service jobs and standards at Lenox Terrace and create many new good jobs. For more than 30 years, 32BJ has represented the 51 workers that currently clean and maintain the Lenox Terrace complex. These jobs are good jobs that pay the prevailing wage and provide working families access to upward mobility. Most property service jobs are filled by the people who live in the community, and when these jobs pay the industry standard, they have low turnover rates. In fact, the majority of the current staff at Lenox Terrace have served the complex for more than 20 years. Good jobs that provide both growth opportunities and security are important investments in New York communities. And the property service jobs that pay the industry standard do just that. This plan will improve the existing buildings at Lenox Terrace, presenting them, for, preserving them for the future. And the creation of new housing units and commercial and community facility, facility space will generate about 35 new property service jobs. Because Olnick had made a credible commitment to provide prevailing wage building service jobs, these jobs will give access to a new generation of property service workers to live and work with dignity. 32BJ has a long-time partnership with Olnick organization and, now, and knows they will continue to be a responsible employer in Harlem. On behalf of the more than 2,532BJ members, 32 BJ members that live and work in Community District 10 and our broader New York City membership, we urge you to approve this project. Thank you. Thank you. Winston? Make sure that your microphone is turned on. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Winston Majed, representing Harlem Week Incorporated. Uh, honorable Council Persons, the Board of Directors of Harlem Week Inc wishes to inform you that we believe the applications before you for consideration regarding the Linux Terrace renovation and new development can and will bring meaningful benefit to the greater Harlem area as well as to the goals and objectives of Harlem Week. With that in mind, we encourage you to support the Linux Terrace applications. Harlem Week cares deeply about the future of our community. That is why we are in favor of the various positive community benefit components that the Linux Terrace initiative can bring to Harlem if properly planned. Harlem Week is pleased to work in concert with our community partners in the Old Nick Group to strengthen the overall community impact of the proposed new Linux Terrace development project. We believe this development, when properly aligned with its associated community benefits, will enhance and complement the continued growth of our local parks, parks such as Howard Bennett Playground and St. Nicholas Park, our health and fitness facilities such as the Hansborough Recreation Center, Kennedy Center, and the Harlem YMCA, our major health facility, Harlem Hospital Center, and of course our historic cultural and library facilities such as the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture and the County Cullen Library. Over the past 10 years, Harlem Week has worked directly with the owner group on major community projects, including our Summer in the City project, the third Saturday of August, Harlem Day, the third Sunday of August, and the Percy Sutton Harlem 5K and Health Walk, all taking place on West 135th Street between Fifth Avenue and St. Nicholas Avenue. We also have worked with them with the New York City Marathon, which is the first Sunday of each November. We believe that the proposed development plan and application before you can provide a unique opportunity to address many of the ever-growing needs of our service area. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Cleston Lord. I'm here on behalf of the Great Harlem Chamber of Commerce and its president, Lloyd A. Wood Williams. The, the Chamber of Commerce um, it's pleased to inform you that we support the application before you for consideration regarding Linux Terrace innovation and new development. The proposed plan for the Linux Terrace has the potential to be an economic boom for our community, creating hundreds of part-time and full-time jobs during the development and operational phases, as well as creating numerous business opportunities for local opportun op 
entrepreneurs. Development phase will provide substantial opportunities for local service providers, contractors, and small benefits, and businesses, excuse me. It is further our understanding from the only group that the project is committed to seeking to accomplish the minimum goal of 30% MWLBE participation. We also look forward to the substantial re revitalization of the retail, commercial, and professional services environment, which will benefit the Chambers target area of West 127th Street to West 142nd Street, east from Fifth Avenue to west of St. Nicholas Avenue. Because we are concerned about the issues of gentrification, we recognize that the development of the newly affordable housing in Harlem is key to our community. Therefore, we are pleased that the development, when concluded, is guaranteed to provide between four and 500 additional permanently affordable apartments earmarked in the main for Harlem residents. We believe that the applicant has demonstrated flexibility in its proposals before you as submitted to ensure that much needed affordable housing will remain as a key aspect and consideration of this proposed development package. We therefore request that you, as well as New York State Center, as, as well as our New York State Senator, our New York State Assembly member, and of course our community board be supportive of our, of our focus on community benefits in this project. Okay. Sincerely, Lloyd A. Williams. President. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony today. I'm calling up the next panel, uh, Julius uh, Tejidin. How do you say it? Well, there you go. Uh, Dr. Jim uh, Fairbanks, uh, Valerie Joe Bradley, and Alex uh, Glennell. Glennell, Glennell. Oh, I'm sorry, it's with an F? I, I, I couldn't read your handwriting, sorry. Fennell. Sorry, Alex. It's, it's four. It's four, right? Yeah. Julius, Dr. Fairbanks, Valerie, Alex, right? Okay, perfect. Th thank you. Good morning, council members. I ask that you vote no on the Lennox Terrace rezoning application in its entirety for the reasons expressly articulated in the Manhattan Community Board 10 resolution regarding same recommendation of the Honorable Gail Brewer, Manhattan Borough President, and the oral testimony and written testimony by me submitted to the City Planning Commission of New York City on December 17, 2019. I submit to you the same written document on file at the City Planning Commission. However, today I will not be redundant. Instead, I will emphasize on the Commission's misunderstanding or lack thereof of the Voting Rights Act of 1965 as amended in 2006, known as the Fannie Lou Hammer, Rosa Parks, and Coretta Scott King Voting Rights Act Reauthorization and Amendments Act of 2006. A few of the commissioners had concerns whether this application would violate such act. Chairman Castro, in answering one particular commissioner's address of the matter on the day of the vote, who wasn't in attendance at the hearing, simply said that the issue was addressed in a later report by counsel and that basically it did not apply to rezonings, rather redistricting. This seems to be a common thought throughout certain circles when it comes to issues pertaining to race, in particular, African-American communities. I wish today I could tell you that it's not a race issue, but it is a race issue. The plain meaning of the phrase found in Section 5B of such act, any standard practice or procedure, clearly implies that there are other things besides redistricting that can negatively impact or dilute a protected group's right, uh, voting rights. And the right that we assert will be diluted or diminished is our right as a protected class to have the ability to elect a candidate in our single member district, such as city council, of our preference. Briefly, I will use as an example standard. What is meant by standard within the meaning of the section? It simply is something established by authority, custom, or general consent as a model, example, or point of reference. 
example, the housing model for inclusionary housing is 75% open market and 25% affordable, um, which as of 2020 does not work for us. Thank you. Um, I just wanted this. Uh, we have to. We have to wrap it up. We have real a long quick. List. Um, we meet the qualifications that are found in Thornburg versus Gingle. Okay. Thank uh, you. Shelby County was upheld. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll we have my, to. Yeah. We have to move on. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Fairbanks. Hi, I'm Dr. Jim Fairbanks. Uh, I was served as Chief of Staff to Councilmember Reverend Wendell Foster and Helen Diane Foster for some 35 years. So I thank the Council for their condolences, the recent death of Reverend Foster. So I'm here today to oppose not only this rezoning, but all changes in rezonings to downscale it. This, we're talking about the most iconic and historic housing in the history of Harlem and we just can't push the residents out. There's historic organizing going on in the city of New York. Wherever these rezonings have popped up, communities have organized like never before. I'm a member of CASA for 12 years, Make the Road, Vocal New York City, on and on groups have stood up because they understand this is gentrification. Uh, this is unaffordable. It is displacement. It is the removal of cultures of decades and decades of neighborhoods, the removal of cultures. In the South Bronx, in Casa, we've seen that take place. Our main industry on the rezoning, the jobs in the auto industry have left. There's a rippling effect that people are um, just being forced out. So this has to stop. Um, amenities that Olnick is they could offer that. They don't need a rezoning promise from us to fix up our buildings. Uh, Oltnick also owns a forest in the South Bronx, three square blocks overlooking the Harlem Hospital. So they're not here now. Maybe they are. So a, a warning to you already organizing to stop you from developing and ruining our forest. Um, housing should be built for the AMI of the residents of that community. We also need low, moderate, supportive housing for our people. That's how to end the homeless problem. Instead, we've given over our city to the millionaires, wannabe billionaires, who just want to push us out and make money. Thank you very much. Thank you. Valerie? Just make sure your microphone is My name is Valerie Bradley, and I'm president of Save Harlem Now. The current plan to add five 28-story mixed buildings, mixed-use buildings to Lenox Terrace threatens its cultural and historical significance. It is unfortunate that the City Planning Commission has approved this plan. Now that the issue has been referred to the City Council, we as Harlem's preservation organization urge you to stand with the tenants of Lenox Terrace, Council Member Bill Perkins, Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer, and Manhattan Community Board 10, who oppose the rezoning plan. Peg Green, CEO of the New York Landmarks Conservancy, recently said in a letter to Gail Brewer, Lenox Terrace is worthy of landmark designation because it represents an outstanding example of mid-century architecture and planning and has a remarkable and social history. For too long, upzoning or inappropriate zoning has facilitated gentrification in Harlem and is changing the face of Harlem's, Harlem uh, all for the sake of a dollar. This has to stop and save Harlem now wants it to stop with Lenox Terrace. We oppose the plan before you. We would like to see Lenox Terrace designated a landmark and plan to ask the Landmarks Preservation Commission to re-examine its decision not to designate the complex. We agree with Peg Breen that Lenox Terrace is a stellar example of mid-century architecture. Designation does not guarantee to stop development, but it would allow the LPC to call for more appropriate buildings. The complex and its residents deserve better. Thus, we urge you to vote no to this plan. Thank you. 
Hi, my name is Alex Fennell. I'm the Network Director of Churches United for Fair Housing. Um, the proposal put forth by Olnick will nearly double the housing units in Lenox Terrace, uh, and the vast majority of those units will be market rate, or what we consider luxury housing. It's significant to note that in its inception, Lenox Terrace was an urban renewal project under Robert Moses, um, and projects, urban renewal projects of that type um, during that period displaced over 250,000 New Yorkers from their homes. Unfortunately, under our current land use system, we see similar patterns of displacement throughout the city, particularly in historic communities of color. Shifting Lenox Terrace to a largely market rate or luxury development will incre increase the displacement of existing tenants, especially given that the developer has already demonstrated they're a bad actor, neglecting needed repairs and illegally deregulating units. Currently, Olnick is holding residents, these residents hostage and threatening not to make the repairs they're legally obligated to make unless they get the zoning changes that they want. Lenox Terrace and the surrounding area has historically been a community that's minority majority, and no one can say how that will change if this development moves forward because that wasn't considered in previous rezonings. And as for us as advocates working throughout the city, we do know what will happen as market rate construction increases in historic communities of color. We see the displacement of residents of color, much like we saw in Williamsburg, where we lost 15,000 Latinx residents despite a 20,000 po person population increase. Without studying how development will affect racial demographics as part of the environmental review process, we can't promise or ensure that proposals will not disproportionately harm residents of color and the community at large. Without this type of analysis, we continue to repose any rezoning that moves forward without a racial impact study um, and um, would like to call on members of this committee to support that um, our legislation, intro 1572, and we echo the concerns of the Lenox Ter Terrace residents and Councilmember Perkins and urge this committee to vote no on this proposal. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you all for your testimony. Uh, I will be calling up the next panel. Uh, Michael Henry Adams, Jean Covington, Cora uh, Percival, Cordell Clear. I so do you have any copies of statements? We'll take them now. If not, take a seat and you uh, identify yourself and you can come over the table. You, just if you can make sure that your microphone is on. Just press that button and see the red light go on. Perfect. Well, good afternoon, Chair Moya, council members, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Michael Adams. And I'm here to testify that New York City has a superb landmarks law. The problem is it is applied in a disproportionate and discriminatory way. In Greenwich Village, Three quarters of the, I'm sorry, two thirds of the buildings are protected by landmarking. And Harlem, only about 15%. The Linux Terrace was the most significant place where African Americans lived when it was completed in 1958. And it is also, as Peg Breen has said, an exemplary building representing mid century modernism. The Landmarks Preservation Commission, guided by the mayor and his misbegotten idea of trickle-down affordable housing, whereby you must have the most luxury housing in order to get any affordable housing, has said that this building, this complex of buildings, is not worthy of being protected as a city landmark. But they're wrong. It meets all of the criteria, as was stated in a letter that I was given by former commission member uh, Roberta Washington who asked me to note that unlike the chair saying that it does not represent the 
architectural significance to merit being landmark, that it meets all of the criteria of the law, that it is both architecturally, culturally, and historically significant. Now, you talk about the idea of how we're going to, with this development, get affordable housing. I would say affordable for whom? That you're going to get new amenities. Amenities for whom? What does it benefit anyone if you create something that's wonderful, but none of the people who live in the community will benefit from it and will all be displaced? At Lenox Terrace, already more than 25% of the existing units are market rate because of decontrol. Thank now you're going to have 75% new units thank, thank that are going your, to be luxury. So you you're going testimony. to essentially have 100% luxury apartments and a new building. I, I appreciate uh, your testimony, but we have to move on. I'm sorry. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Jean Covington. I live in 2186 Fifth Avenue. I've been living in Lenox Terrace for 45 years. Um, I would like to just bring it down a notch and talk about the people that's not here today, our seniors, the ones on walkers, the ones with canes, and couldn't be here today. The impact that this development would have on us as seniors and the children across the street who we have a high rate of asthma, we can't allow them to just destroy our neighborhood. We have our neighbors at Riverbend, we have Riverton. All of this is gonna impact the whole community of Harlem. And I would just like to say, I've seen so much change in our community. When I came to New York and in Harlem, 8th Avenue, no one would walk down 8th Avenue. It was so infested. Now in certain areas, when I go there, I can't see anyone that looked like me. It was designed that way when they build the condos over there. So now what they're doing, they're going to come over by us, and they're going to push us out. And all I'm here to say is for the ones that's not here today, including myself as a senior, please say no. We cannot allow them to push us out and, and I would like the word people of color, but I'm gonna go back and use the word black. Black people like myself, who's gone through so much and we fought like heck to stay here and now we're faced with another displacement. All I'm asking is please say no. Thank you. Hi, my name is Cora Percival. I'm a tenant at Lenox Terrace. I've been there since the inception of the building. Uh, I am here to ask you to vote no. What I would like to do is, um, is paint a visual of, of what I see Linux Terrace as should this happen. If we will have five buildings and we'll build in five or six other buildings around that, I'm looking at a ghetto within a luxury apartment. And if you could visualize what that looked like, what it would mean, I'm a senior also, I doubt if I will be here when this is over, but keep that visual in your mind as you vote no. Keep was going, that, yeah. that? It's okay. You, you, <laughs> I'm so sorry. But um, as a senior, there are, you know, live-in and kids and the, the subways. I'm thinking about the weight of the area, the subway that's there, the water that's there. And if you cannot maintain what we have now, in spite of uh, some of the, the people that were here saying these are jobs for, for local people, for you, why, aren't we, or why aren't we maintaining what we already have and we are begging to have, we don't have enough maintenance, we don't have enough security. What, what are you gonna do when you get all these other buildings around? I, I don't see what you're saying does not validate what you're doing and there is no trust in that. Thank and you. I yield my time. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Cordell Clear. I'm not a resident of Lenox Terrace, but I'm a resident of Harlem and I'm a district leader in Harlem. Um, five new buildings, 1,600 new units, and thousands of new residents to Lenox Terrace will have a tremendous impact on the infrastructure, quality of life, transportation, congested subways and traffic, schools and public services for the residents of Lenox Terrace, but not only for the le residents of Lenox Terrace, but for the entire surrounding community. We will all be subjected to the noise, the dust, the rodents, the traffic, congestion this project will bring and as Harlem is already rapidly gentrifying, this will only expedite tremendously the displacement of Harlem residents in Lenox Terrace and outside of Lenox Terrace. None of the previous rezonings have resulted in housing that Harlem residents who bore the brunt of decades of neglect can afford. This one will not either. 
The people who have lived in Harlem through its darkest period deserve to remain there. Jobs and small business opportunities should be available to them as well. From the outside looking in, you may think this project looks pretty. It looks like new housing and new jobs. But it, for whom? For whom are this, is, is this new housing? This is not a good plan, and the people who live in Harlem are deathly afraid of what it is going to bring, the level of gentrification and the level of racial displacement that this is going to bring. I sit here with this panel today, and I ask that you vote no to this plan. I echo all the words of the panelists before me and our council member, and I ask you, please vote no on this plan. Thank you. Thank you all for your testimony. Uh, the next panel is Paula McCray, Samantha Thompson, Savannah Washington, uh, Lynn Shebar. Paula? Yeah. Samantha? Okay. It, do we have to? Yeah, yeah, you just have to fill out one of these if you're going to read for. Okay. For <clears throat> okay. Do I do that now or after? Yeah. Samantha, is that you? S Samantha? Savannah. Savannah, okay. Do we have a Samantha Thompson here? No? No Samantha Thompson? Okay. Len? Len is here. Okay. So we'll, we'll call her at the next panel. Uh, Derek Blue. So Len, why don't we start with you? With? Starting with me? You have to fill out the, the we'll get to you, don't worry. Okay. Go ahead, yeah. please. Thank you, good afternoon. My name is Len Shebar, and I'm president of the Lennox Harris Association of Concerned Tenants. The tenants of Lennox Terrace are against the rezoning project. In a poll of, in a, I'm sorry, in a poll of tenants this past fall, 95% voted against the rezoning. The tenants have never wavered in their opposition since this idea was first in, introduced over 10 years ago. I'm very pleased that Olnick's initial C6 commercial rezoning proposal received a no with conditions vote from both Community Board 10 and Borough President Gail Brewer. Um, one thing is, Ethan, the planner, mentioned that they removed the commercial components, but to be clear, that didn't just happen in a vacuum. That came about from an outcry from politicians, the community, and conversation with tenants who expressed their disapproval. Councilman Bill Perkins has remained unequivocal and steadfast in his opposition to this overscope proposal since it first was floated years ago. In a meeting last week, he reiterated in no uncertain terms that he is with us, the tenants. Olnick's profit-driven proposal is less about enhancing the property for the benefit of the existing tenants and more about creating a new community altogether. Meanwhile, the existing tenants still deal with continuing maintenance, plumbing, and electrical and understaffing issues. Rezoning has myriad deleterious effects on residents and is totally unnecessary to encourage development at Lennox Terrace. I'm looking at the time. Uh, we can live with the reality of some change. However, the heights and scale of these proposed buildings within the newly proposed R8 rezoning is just unreasonable and wrong, as wrong as the C6 zoning and not in keeping with the existing architectural landscape. As I testified at this Community Board 10 and Manhattan Borough Presence hearings, there needs to be a comprehensive, community-driven zoning plan for Harlem. The district needs a full-scale plan that has ample discussion and input from elected officials, stakeholders, tenants, and the community about the future of Harlem. CB10 and the Manhattan Borough President both highlighted in their recommendations their concerns about, erosion of the, about the erosion of African-American plurality. Before any rezonings, I implore the city to put a moratorium on rezonings and to study the effect on racial displacement. In the meantime, we should all be on the correct side of history and preserving what we can. Regulating heights and maintaining scale, preserving affordability is something that must be done now. I ask that you support our efforts, and when the time comes to vote, no. Thank you very much. 
Good morning. My name is Savannah Washington, and I'm the Vice President of the Linux Terrace Association of Concerned Tenants, the Tenant Association at Linux Terrace. LT Act is against the current proposed R8 rezoning of the Linux Terrace property. We ask that the City Council vote no on the proposed R8 project currently before you. As Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer said in her no recommendation, there are few instances where a development the scale of the one proposed in this application can be viewed as responsible. The proposed project lacks the public and private investments necessary to make it a prudent exercise in of planning for future growth. This project puts a disproportionate impact on local residents, infrastructure, economy, and educational resources. MVP Brewer also mentions the, the East Harlem rezoning and the Inwood rezoning, which covers 69 and 62 square blocks respectively. This project is approximately 40% of the size of these rezonings in just three square blocks. CB10 mentioned in their opposition recommendations to this project that it is completely out of scale for a residential community. George James, the respected urban planner, said of this proposed project that this level of infill for a residential community is extraordinary. CB10 also mentions racial displacement in their no recommendation comments. As you know, racial displacement caused by upzonings have led public advocate Jamani Williams to introduce a bill that would mandate the city conduct a racial impact study as part of the EIS and the ULA process. If not rezoned, uh, Olnick has threatened that it will build as of right without including affordable housing as part of their as of right build. We maintain that any development in the city, including as of right, should include mandatory inclusionary housing. The developers don't get to threaten the city or communities to get what they want. Developers must understand their role as community partners and, if necessary, have that role codified into law to fulfill their role as good community citizens. That includes MIH as part of any build in this city. Uh, there's a feeling in the city sometimes that communities can absorb any amount of development. That is not true. Each community, community reaches a tipping point of what is livable and sustains a livable quality of life. We urge the council to accept the disapproval recommendations of Community Board 10 and MVP Gail Brewer and vote no on the proposed RA Thank rezoning you. request before Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Derek. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is uh, Reverend Dedrick Blue. And I serve as a representative of the New York Interfaith Commission for Housing Equality and the 55 congregations that are in the immediate area and the hundreds of congregations in Harlem and the surrounding communities who are absolutely opposed to this walled off fortress for the rich. We have learned that urban renewal means Negro removal. And so we are opposed for several reasons. First of all, the environmental impact, the disproportionate racial impact and its impact upon voting rights. We are opposed to this because it is not affordable. And those who say that it will provide more jobs, I would simply say to them, the people who are getting the jobs won't be able to afford to live in the building that they're working on. This will dramatically change the AMI, essentially gutting the community. The community board is opposed to this. The residents are opposed to this. The borough president is opposed to this. The houses of worship are opposed to this. The city council person is opposed to this. So if the proposal moves forward, who does it benefit? It represents the moneyed interests of the gilded real estate brokers who would sell their mothers for a dime. If we allow a developer to run roughshod over the expressed will of the residents, then that is a dangerous precedent to set. Therefore, I urge that this proposal not be forwarded for a vote to the city council. The slumlords say that they will mediate, that they will not uh, uh, mitigate against uh, asbestos and plumbing and rodents unless they get this bill passed. And then they expect the residents to, to trust them in the process. It is unsustainable, it is unreasonable, and I urge a no vote. Thank you. Thank you. So, folks, please. Joanne Scott, is that? I am Joanne Scott. Okay. Uh, just to clarify, are you testifying as well, or are you yes. just. Re okay. So, for uh, Paula McRae, you can just submit her testimony, and then you can, you can testify. We're My little testimony is only like five seconds, so can I read them both? If you keep it under two minutes, yeah. go ahead. Okay. okay. Or at two minutes, I should say so. Okay. Good afternoon. Right now I'm reading for Paula McRae. 
My name is Paula McRae, and I am a lifelong resident of Harlem, specifically Central Harlem. My tenancy in the Lenox Terrace began in 1979 when I returned home from college to reside with my parents. Before that, I lived in a tenement around 133rd and 131st Street. The Lenox Terrace was a place we walked by in awe of the elegance. Our household needs were met by patronizing the local businesses, especially those on Fifth Avenue between 132nd and 135th Street. For the last 15 years, I have had to look out of my apartment window to see the abandoned property left behind when Olnick decided to shut the businesses down. The, this proposed C6 rezoning project will have a catastrophic effect on the people in the area not experienced since 9-11. There will be no place for the existing residents to flee, as has occurred since 9-11. The toxic dust, noise, and reduction of light will create not only health problems, but put a strain on the mass transit system and school safety. Traffic congestion will be worse than downtown in the commercial and theater districts. I propose that Olnick use the funds to repair the infrastructure of the existing buildings, which will not be able to withstand the pressures from the proposed construction. Lenox Terrace and the surrounding area is historic. Doing anything other than making improvements on the existing structures will erase its rich history for the community. I ask you to disapprove Olnick's request for the C6 rezoning with no conditions. And I'm saying it appears that Olnick has a disdain for the community right now. They have not mentioned the 135th Street on Fifth Avenue where the children go to school. How are they going to protect their education through the noise? Th thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your testimony today. I'd like to call up the next panel, Samantha Thompson. Samantha Thompson. Going once, going twice. OK, no Samantha Thompson. Uh, Deacon Rodney uh, Beckford. Beatrice Diaz Tavares. Coloma Cardwell. No, it's a second time. And Gary Sales. That's Deacon Rodney Beckford. <laughs> We'll, we'll start with you, Deacon, whenever you're ready. Okay. I'm Rodney Beckford, uh, Deacon Rodney Beckford, uh, Catholic Deacon, Roman Catholic Church. I'm the, exec I'm the director of Kennedy Center for Catholic Charities Community Services. Uh, I'm going to pitch the ball to the executive director of Catholic Charities Community Services, where she will um, definitely point out uh, what I will say, state as uh, uh, the, the absence of speaking to a very large uh, uh, institution that sat uh, sits in the middle of, uh, uh, of Lenox Terrace and was there before Lenox Terrace was developed and has been ignored in this process because no one has spoken to us. And I'll pass this on to our Executive Director of Catholic Charities Community Services. Thank you. And good afternoon, Chairman Moya. Mike. Mike. Sorry. Good afternoon, Chairman Moya and the members of the New York City Council Subcommittee on Zoning and Franchises. I'm Beatrice Diaz Tavares, Executive Director of Catholic Charities Community Service, and I'm joined by my colleague, Deacon Rodney Beffert, who's the Director of Lieutenant Joseph P. Kennedy Memorial Center. I thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony today regarding the application submitted by Lennox Terrace. I'm here to express our disappointment in the lack of engagement of Catholic Charities in such an important project for, Harlem community, for the Harlem community, where we serve day in and day out. Kennedy Center is located right in the middle of the Lenox Terrace development. And New Yorkers come in need come to Kennedy Center, not only for case management, benefits, entitlement assistance, utility assistance, eviction prevention, but also for our food pantry and our senior center, which is located in Kennedy Center. Under the proposed zoning changes, the area included Kennedy Center will go from a R72 to a R8, allowing for more potential residential development at the site. The final scope of work for preparation of a draft environmental impact statement 
projects that the lots occupied by Kennedy Center and the Metropolitan AMA Church, if fully utilizing the maximum FAR allowable under the proposed rezoning, could be developed with approximately 69 new dwelling units for community and also some community facilities use. The report assumes that up to 30% of the residential units could be designated as affordable, making Kennedy Center, our location, a desirable location for residential and community facility development. We are deeply concerned with Olnek's proposed plan, which although it acknowledges the potential of Kennedy Center, clearly misrepresents our willingness to engage in the development process. In its final in environmental impact statement, Olnick says, while these lots could be rezoned under proposed action, the owner of the Kennedy Center, Catholic Charities of the Thank Archdiocese Thank of New you. York, has indicated you, that it has no intention. Hold on, Thank just two more minutes. I, I, I'm taking his minute. Take my minute. <laughs> <laughs> has no intention of we, developing the Kennedy Center site. This is inaccurate. We were never consulted by Olnick, and we have we do believe in developing affordable initiatives in New York City as we have partnered with the city before. So thank you so thank, much. Thank for you. Time. Thank you very much. Thank you to both of you. My name is Coloma Cardwell. The vast majority of tenants want you to kill this plan, not modify it, not tweak it, not hope that it becomes something that it isn't. We want you to do that because this plan will displace us, black, Latino, working class people in Harlem, because the plan is a scam. Now, almost every, scam, almost every scam begins with promises. It begins with offering a few benefits. So you've heard some of the people here focus on those benefits or potential benefits or promises, but almost every one of them qualified their comments by saying, we're only here in support of the positive aspects. Translation is, there are negative aspects that they're not going to speak to. So let me speak to those briefly in addition to my colleagues here. On the question of displacement, on the question of affordable housing, their track record is pretty clear. So when we hear people say, based on our experience, we believe they will be responsible employers, we're asking you as tenants to listen to us when we say, based on our experience as tenants, they have been driving displacement in Harlem. So what they haven't mentioned is that at this moment, they're involved in a class action suit in which a class of potentially hundreds of members have been fighting them in court over uh, allegations related to illegally deregulated apartment units. So when they say our plan will involve XYZ promise, what does that mean for a group of people who have something that's much more ironclad than a promise? They have the law. And when it came to their deregulated, rent-stabilized uh, units who were made deregulated, ONIC came back and told us the promise was not enough, the law was not enough. If you want to enforce, see us in court. So it's a scam, and all we're asking is that uh, City Council, Speaker Johnson, if you support this, don't just focus on the benefits and act like you're doing us a favor. Uh, Gary. Hi, my name is Gary Sales. I'm a resident of Lenox Terrace, um, and I've been a resident of New York City my entire life. I've lived in the East Village, where I first got there and paid $59 a month rent. That same apartment is now $2,100. I've lived in Hell's Kitchen, and the same thing has happened there. I can feel the rumblings of that kind of gentrification taking place here. Uh, also, what we're talking about here is, if I understand this correctly as a layman, whether we approve this project and their re rezoning that they request or not, their as of right gives them the ability to build no matter what. And if that's the case, what I see in this article that came out yesterday about their plan B and going to an as of right, they take away all of the supposed promises that my associate just brought up, that says to me that they don't have any real feeling for this neighborhood. They don't want to do anything. That's kind of in disingenuous. So I, I find that a bit of, a, of an issue to be concerned with how they really think about what they're doing. 
This is a profit-based thing. This is not a community-based thing. They're not trying to do something for the community. They're trying to offer some promises so they can make profit. The other thing is they've said it's a seven-year window to get this done. Well, you know what else is seven years? Common law marriage. <laughs> this is a marriage. Wanna, they want to marry into the Lenox Terrace community, specifically the residents that have been there. Well, you want to get married, you better offer some dowry here. And you can't just offer it if you get everything you want. And if we don't do it your way and give you 28-story buildings and impact the community in the manner you would like to do it, and you go as of, and you take all that away, well, that's kind of like the old offer you can't refuse type of deal there. What are, what are they doing? It's disingenuous. And I question the, the idea of as of, whether it applies to projects that are as long as seven years that'll really put people out for that long. They need to make a better commitment. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you all for your testimony today. And Delcina Glover. Last name Glover. And no Samantha Thompson. Okay. Thank you. Are, are there any other members of the public who wish to testify? Uh, seeing none, uh, I now close the public hearing on this application and it will be laid over. Uh, this concludes today's meeting and I would like to thank the members of the public, my colleagues, uh, council and land use staff uh, for attending. This meeting is hereby adjourned.